everyone, I am Nathaniel Rufflejance from Nintendo Prime, and I am joined on this podcast, as always, by Mr. <laughs> Eric Moore. Yeah, exactly, okay. Eric Moore. You're the co-host. <laughs> I, I didn't know where you were going with this, because you, you normally, normally you introduce me, so... You, you should need no introduction. No, I, I don't. <laughs> um, can I go by Mr. Sexy now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know it. Arnie's. Um, this week we're also joined by two other special guests. One that seems to be a regular, one that's a semi-regular. Uh, of course, those people would be the one and only streamer extraordinaire, Mr. 5J Gaming. Hey, guys. And the... I, I guess I used to consider him to be like a Zelda YouTuber, but he does so much other stuff on his channel now. I don't know what he is anymore. <laughs> Mr. Game Over Jesse. Hi. Thanks for inviting me back on once In fact, again. Isn't it like the most popular things you. on your channel have nothing to do with Zelda? Pretty much, yeah. Um, <laughs> you like a 400,000 view video and it's like top five scariest moments in gaming or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes, oh, yes. Oh. And by the way, uh, I don't know if our editor is going to fully get it out, so I do apologize for our Game Over Jesse's pet cricket that's apparently in the <laughs> audio. I don't know. Hopefully editing can take care of it. Uh, editor, good luck. But uh, if it doesn't work, I, I apologize. It's okay. It's only slightly annoying, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I believe this is episode 31. I think we hit 30 last time. Did, did we? Yes. I, <laughs> well, because sure. we don't have this weekly know, right now. I it's it's right. uh I don't always remember. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's episode 31. And as always, uh, we're here to have all this talk about a bunch of Nintendo stuff. Um, I was going to talk about Patreon, but, you know, I'll save that for the end this time. Uh, this is, this week, for our video version, we are again going to try one long video. Uh, this time, we're just going to title it Podcast, you know, Nintendo Prime Podcast, episode 31, and that's it. That's going to be the title. Ooh. We'll see if... Uh, we'll see how many people are just interested in checking out the podcast for itself, not based on what we're talking about. Because a lot of other things I do are based on what we're talking about, right? Like, oh, I'm talking about Switch Bang Gate, or I'm talking about, uh, like, the recent topic that I just talked about, I think today, actually, was uh, the day of recording this about should the Switch replace the 3DS. It's a topic we talked about on the podcast before, but I had some additional thoughts. And uh, that's fine and everything. The topic's cool to draw people. My opinion's cool to draw people, but... I want to see people that are just interested in this as a strict podcast rather than uh, just checking yeah. this out because of the topic. So we'll see how that works. Obviously, if everything hits the fan, we could go back to splitting the podcast up in the future. I, I don't want to go back to that, but we'll see what happens. More editing. More <laughs> editing. Yay. Yay. So uh, let's just get right into it. We have three topics this week. Two of them uh, were selected by me. One of them was actually, for the first time ever, selected by somebody else. Mr. 5J over there. Uh, hey! Not the first time. <laughs> not, I, yeah, yeah. You had you had some topics before. No, no, not even that. But Who, I think we had one, one fan topic at one point. Oh, in time. wow. Fan topics are always... Like, by the way, yeah. uh, we always allow fan topics. We don't get a lot of them submitted very often. Uh, you can ask them down in the YouTube comments if you would like. Chances are I'm probably going to forget about it by the time we record our next podcast since we're not weekly. <laughs> Just being honest. Wow. But if you yeah. don't want me to forget about your fan topic, over on Patreon, I know I didn't want to talk about it right now, but it's the best way to get your fan topic to us. Even if you are only a $1 supporter on Patreon, you still get access to a Patreon-exclusive post I put up every single week or every week that we're going to have a podcast asking for fan topics. It's like specifically about fan topics. So if you just support us for one dollar, you can get your fan topic in. If you only want to do that for one month, just to get your topic in for however many podcasts we have, great. Um, or you could submit twenty topics and bail out after a month. And well, I guess I have twenty topics. Okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> hey, why not? But uh, let's just hop right into the topics for this week. Uh, and and the reason I kept it down to just three, outside of the fact that I'm I'm so tired. Like yeah. Eric and I were helping my parents move into a new house. Yeah. Uh, I know Five J has been busy busy uh, tonight and. He over Jesse, I, I don't know. He didn't get back to me until like an hour before the podcast, so I'm assuming he was busy too. Uh, I, I've noticed that we've been going, we've been hitting the two and the two, two hour to two and a half hour mark consistently. And 
I realize I don't need four or five topics because we just keep spinning off into extra topics anyways. We do. Pretty much. Like, yeah. the like the Mother 4 debate was totally not on the topic list. It just happened. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I already Twice. know that this is going to spin off Twice. and have its own, to- own side topics and whatever. As long as you guys enjoy the discussion, that's what matters. And the first topic for this week, uh, the Nintendo of America did a poll uh, asking their Twitter followers... Uh, how do they play their Switch, or where do they play their Switch? And the poll concluded with 46,655 votes, which isn't a small margin. That, that's a pretty significant margin of votes. Mm-hmm. Uh, 7% of the people said that they play it on, mostly on an, on the airplane. 5% say they play it mostly on a bus or train. Uh, 5% say they mostly play it on the beach slash park. And a whopping 83% say they play it at home. So the question I have for you three is where do you mostly play your Switch? Who are we first? starting with? Whoever, <laughs> hey, well, just jump in. Whoever wants to jump in on this. All right, Pop J, do you want to go first? Sure. So first, I thought that the question was a little weird. Like, how much time do you really spend on a train in the beach? You know? You spend most of your time at home, right? Whether or not it's sleeping or or eating or whatever, uh, maybe uh, you are uh, somebody who's on the road a lot, but most people spend, you know, two thirds of their day at home the other day, a 30 year day working. So it seems to me that they weren't going to get very good data out of this. It should have been more of like, choose all of the places where you play your switch. Do you play it when you're uh, in the car on a bus on the subway? Do you play it when you go out anywhere with your friends or do you leave it at home? Mm -hmm. Do you take it uh, traveling in an airplane? Yeah, I think I think that poll, makes more yeah. sense. I think, right? this, I think this poll uh, was flawed in that I think I understand what they were trying to find out. They were trying mm-hmm. to find out what's the split between people playing it on their portable TV versus... and people playing it portable. And right. My my whole theory with this question is that why didn't they just come straight out and say, "Look, yes. do you play it on your TV or do you play it in handheld?" Because even right. 3DS yeah. players play it at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. So it's right. like. If you want to figure out it, because th- this tells them nothing. There, there's nothing to benefit from this. There's not even an interesting fact. Exactly. It's, it's like, oh, only five percent of your people uh, take a bus or train. Well, guess what? A bus or train's not really even an option where I live. Yeah, right. Um, right. There's, I mean, there's a beach. I guess I wouldn't call it a beach, but we have beaches. <laughs> hey, Ray's Beach. Yeah, Ray's Beach. There's, there's Riverview water. Beach as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, both have signs saying "Don't swim." So, <laughs> yeah, uh, that. man-made things. They yeah, polluted. Yeah, yeah. Like it. it so it's like so the five percent bus or train that's going to apply to big cities. Uh, yep. The yep. beach or park are, are basically going to apply to people that coast. either live by really big parks or live on the coast. Uh, and I know that's where like a lot of people in the United States live, but not everyone. Uh, yeah, and so, there's a lot of states that have winter that is uh, cold and snowy. So it, <laughs> yeah. that question would be seasonal then. Yeah. So I think I understand where they were going with it. I think they just should have been more direct. Yes. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of people that I know that have only played their Switch in docked mode a few times. Oh, really? They mostly just use it as a portable device or like as Nate was saying, even if they're at home playing, they're on the couch playing it or they're in their bedroom, yes. they're not necessarily playing it on the And big I think TV. it would have been a really interesting question too if they put it that way because I know personally, mm-hmm. you know we're talking about where do you play your Switch? Now I know that my answer is I primarily play it in doctor mode, but that's because of what I do here. Exactly. Um, I live stream. I Now, I have sort of... Um, so I met with this guy uh, talking about a partnership, and he sort of, kind of, sort of let slip exactly how to use Nintendo footage without getting copyright claimed. Ooh, we Oops. must talk after this. Yeah. I need to know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nothing I can do about live streams, but about any other content. Um, sure okay but uh it's it, it's interesting it's cool that, that that i now know how to do this that means i'm going to have more footage being shown in my stuff there'll still be still images and stuff but there'll be relevant footage or if i happen to be really lazy that day like one video i did today was a 17 minute video 17 minutes of me playing breath of the wild now it just happened to be i was talking about switch and i mentioned breath of the wild a bunch so it was kind of topical and i don't game over jesse hates when people play 
games on their videos that are irrelevant to the conversation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, granted, that, 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 that's, uh, that's not... That's never going to be true with us, because I'm going to I'm play games that are on the, the Switch. Right. You know, or on mm-hmm. the 3DS. So yeah, like if you're not going to see, you're not gonna see me busting out Destiny 2 on right. PC while I'm talking about Switch sales or something. <laughs> um, right. But I understand why YouTubers do it, because it's easier to get around the copyright claims. Uh, and I feel like for me, you know, where do you play your switch? Well, because of what I do, it's primarily docked mode. But if I'm honest about if I wasn't a YouTuber, it would be portable because I wouldn't be in my office all day next to my dock. I wouldn't be able to use my TV because my kids are using it. Uh, Mm -hmm. I would be playing it handheld because I just think when I'm not working, because I, I consider, even when I play games, I consider myself working. It's very rare I get to sit down and just play a game and not think about how it impacts what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Especially on Switch. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm playing Madden. That doesn't right. matter outside right. of my thoughts on how Madden can work on Switch. Also, even when I'm playing other systems, I'm, I keep thinking, <laughs> right. uh, how, could this, how could this work? Uh, yep. But it, So it's hard for me to get out of that mindset and get back to just being just a gamer. So because of that, it's primarily docked. But I think about like... Other things I play that I don't cover. I play tap sports baseball a lot on my phone. Mm-hmm. I play, uh, you know, a lot of things. You know, if I do happen to play a, a, a game on my Switch that's not for a stream or not for anything, it's a small indie game that I don't plan to cover. And I, it's all in portable. Sure. So it's like, I think I would primarily use my Switch in portable mode if I wasn't a YouTuber needing to record mm-hmm. footage and needing to stream all the time. Uh, yeah. So it's like, I appreciate that it's a docked console because it would suck if I had to buy a modded Switch to record like I did with the 3DS. $500 for a modded 3DS that I've technically never recorded footage off of even once. Oh Um, my gosh, really? I made a test recording when I got it to make sure it worked. Um, (laughs) Yikes. Whether or not it still works, I guess I I don't know for sure. Did we not make any... uh, Triforce Heroes? Heroes No videos, no, we never did. Because we were working Uh, on the written walkthrough at the time. uh, And then the Psycho Bot, so... Right, it didn't really matter. Right, uh, but yeah. So I, I guess that kind of question pointed at like any question about where I play Switch is going to be unfair for me. Yeah, and unfair for even Five J. I mean, you know, we're we're talking about three people here who make video content, and then there's Eric. Right, and I have still what? yet to dock my. Three, have you even uh, taken your my... dock out of your box? No, it's besides it's on my one. box, but it's just it hooked up to anything. No, it, no. it's still wow. sitting. Yeah, no, I have yet to dock my my Switch. That's so amazing. Now, you are someone who plays basically exclusively portable. You just said, yeah. Where do, where do you where is. do you primarily play it? Um, home. Yeah, or if I'm here, playing. Okay. I was actually curious. Too. I was actually curious if you played it outside of here because um, I do play it at home every once in a while. Okay, I, I was, that's what I was wondering because I almost felt guilty that you got to switch day one. It's like you only play it when you're here, but you're an unpaid worker. <laughs> 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 um, you don't have to only play it when you're here. What are you talking about? I'm a, I'm a paid worker. I pay you to work. <laughs> <laughs> some days, some days. Um, but no, it. Yeah, you're still unpaid. Yeah, I'm negative paid. Yeah, negative paid. Oh, but no, there's. I don't know. So I guess this is a hard topic for you to talk about in hindsight because uh, outside of Eric. We all kind of obligated to almost play it in dock mode. Well, but I'd say that, you know, when I'm not streaming, I'm still playing games. Yeah. And of uh, so I have, I'm, right now where I'm sitting is my streaming area. Here's a TV in front of me. My Switch dock is there. Everything runs through my capture card all the time because it'd be too much of a hassle to unhook it. So many times I will put like Netflix on the TV instead of the switch and be sitting here in this chair, even though the dock is right there and play it in portable mode while I got a TV show going. Mm-hmm. So and that's how yeah, I would do primarily, it. Too. I like it as a portable platform as well. Yep. On my TV, like even when I'm working and making videos outside of when I'm actually recording audio, I'm always playing Netflix in the background. Yeah, I have the brewer game. Going brewer brewer games going, Packer games going, uh, you know, Bucks games when I start up again. Like, I always have something going on in the background as something I, I'm definitely paying attention to, but I'm not, it's not distracting me a lot. For, it, well, it's helping me actually exactly. kind of focus on my work. Uh, so, yeah, like, I think if it wasn't, especially now that I'm going to be recording footage for, uh, for my videos, I think I would be one of those, as much as I almost hate to say it, because I've spent so much time dissing the 3DS that people think I hate it. 
uh, <laughs> that I would be an exclusive, almost an exclusive handheld gamer with it. Um, very mm-hmm. few times would I actually, even when I think about like Breath of the Wild, it runs better and is looks better to me in 720p on that screen than it does on my bigger TV. Um, and it's a nice screen. It is. Even at 720p, like once you get a screen that size, it, the resolution doesn't matter as much exactly. unless you're like looking for perfect colors. Um, like some, sure. some, some media artists will easily notice the coloration is not exactly perfect. Yeah. Uh, it's why, not AMOLED. That's not AMOLED. Uh, or, <laughs> or, uh, you know, pixel density matters for things like VR. So if we were right. using it in a virtual reality situation, yeah, 720p probably not good work, but I don't know. You guys have any other thoughts on like, where do you play your switch and portable versus handheld portable versus Doctor mode, <laughs> Jesse. Uh, you didn't speak up a whole lot there. What are your thoughts? No, I, like I, I was just thinking that for me, it really is perfect for both situations. But I, yeah. you typically find myself playing it on the go, just because I'm either on the go or someone is watching TV already. Um, as some of you mentioned, it's really nice to have a movie on or a TV show in the background and then play the switch. Mm -hmm. Uh, I find myself whenever I'm doing uh, like playing the game while doing something else, it's I'm listening to a podcast while I'm playing the game. Um, Not necessarily listening or watching a TV show, but with even with my little brother, um, and this, I don't know if you guys uh, know any <laughs> little kids, if you have any little brothers, sisters, or kids, or whatever, but he prefers playing it in handheld mode as well, um, just to yeah. get, like, a kid's perspective into this. Uh, like, I'll notice nobody is on the TV, there's no movies or anything that people are watching, but he still prefers to play it in handheld mode. Oh, yeah. Um I don't know mm-hmm. if that's because the screen's closer to him or <laughs> if it's more comfortable for him, but I always find it interesting to see people's different preferences because every time mm-hmm. that I would play a game on the 3DS or the Vita in the back of my head, I was thinking, oh, well, this is fun, but it would be cool to see how it would look on an actual console on a TV. Sure. But now that we have a mm-hmm. console that can do both, it seems most people are playing it in handheld mode so it's kind right. of counterproductive to what i was saying but well, still I think interesting it's, yeah i think it's interesting in that the if you look at the history i mean this is obviously just talking about nintendo platforms uh but you, know, you could even almost argue that it, it kind of ties into even sony who had a successful handheld platform at one point in the psp mm-hmm. um handheld gaming has almost always been more popular than any individual home console gaming. Uh, Like, even for Nintendo, as big as the NES and SNES were, even as big as the Wii was, it was not their best seller that generation. It was always the handheld. And I think, you know, now that Nintendo's reached a stage where the Switch and the 3DS uh, now can both be portable, but one's also be able to use in your TV, now you give console gamers that love playing on the console, if you just want to play strictly in dock mode, that's fine. And I know there's plenty of our viewers that do just that. But I think when you're given the choice, you're finding that a lot more people are going to choose handheld. And that kind of gets into my whole conversation I, I just had, you know, a few days before this podcast aired about, you know, the Switch replacing the 3DS, and we've talked about it before. Uh, I, you know, when, when you talk about where do you play or, or how do you play it, because so many people are playing it in portable mode, it's almost like, why does the 3DS still exist? Besides the fact right. that it already has a big install base? Because That's what, the only reason. Like, what, game, <laughs> what games do they do on 3DS you can't do on Switch? Like, even with the two-screen thing, I'm sorry, there hasn't been so much unique things done with that two-screen thing that you can't do that on one. No, it was almost dead by the end of the DS, and then they made a whole new console with it. Yeah. Well, they, they did something similar to how, like, the 3DS, the only reason that, I mean, realistically, whatever Nintendo wants to tell you, the only reason they are still supporting the 3DS is just because everybody who wants a Switch 
can't get one. And the 3DS still has millions and millions of units that they can still put the games on. Mm-hmm. It was the same whenever the 3DS first came out. They were making new games for the 3DS. Everybody thought whatever the sequel or the follow-up to Black and White was, was sure. going to be on the 3DS. It made yeah. sense. But because the Nintendo DS still had a, a massive yeah. amount more mm-hmm. units sold than the 3DS, which at that time was still new, they ended up putting the best-selling game on the DS because they knew it would make more money there. It wasn't mm-hmm. really because it was better suited for the DS or anything like that. It was just, well, we may have 5 million 3DSs sold. We could put the game on there. Or this other thing has 40, 50, 60 million units sold. We could put it on there and make 10 times as much money. That's the main reason that they're still putting these games on the 3DS. Sure. Or at least that's my thought. Mm-hmm. No, I, I totally, yeah, I totally get it. It's it's one of those that I think the 3DS is just around because it's already sold and has a big install base. Uh, and we've talked in the past about you know they're not really having their A teams on 3DS right now. Heck, we're getting a Pokemon RPG now for for Switch, which has never happened on yes. anything close to resembling a home console. Uh, although <laughs> although they did technically, I think, have one in development for the N64 at one point. Um, yeah, that never nope. never released, but. Uh, <laughs> It's still uh, really interesting uh, in that I feel like the Switch is in a unique place where I'm starting to think people who, so, some crazy analyst on and, and GameStop and other people out there say, oh, the Switch could be a 100 million unit seller. I'm starting to think it's not so crazy. Mm-hmm. Because I, got, I, I start looking at, you know, okay, the 3DS is the worst selling handheld in Nintendo's history, but it's still sold like 70 million units. Minus the Virtual Boy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't consider that a handheld or a home console. <laughs> I consider it garbage, it's but a, let's it, move it, on. It's, an ex- <laughs> it's a virtual reality experiment that failed. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, so yeah, you have the 3DS at 70 million, which that's you know, only like 10 million back of, of like the Game Boy, which is the next one up. Uh, so it's not even that bad, but I'm like, okay, so if you combined... Let's say there's 70 million people that, that still love playing Nintendo games portable. Then you combine that with the 13 million people that bought the Wii U to play games as a home console. That's 83 million units sold. Is it that crazy to think the Switch could sell 17 more million units than that since it combines both those audiences together? Uh, I, I don't know if it's that crazy. Now, obviously, there's crossover, right? I think most people yep. that owned a Wii U probably also owned a 3DS. So it's not mm-hmm. an exact one-to-one ratio, but... Uh, my main argument when I said, you know, Switch should take over the 3DS is that I think Nintendo, I think we've never seen Nintendo at their absolute best because they've always split their attention between two platforms. I think if they could put all of their development force for games into a single platform, one, it ends game droughts regardless of third-party support. I also think it might lead to more third-party support because there's going to be a reason for people to buy a Switch every single month. All third parties would have to do then is release their games on the weeks when the Nintendo games aren't releasing. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, we've already seen that, you know? The, the weeks that ARMS aren't coming out, Splatoon 2 is not coming out, other games come out, you know, just the Sonic Mania come out. And I'm yes. sure I, we haven't seen sales for it on Switch yet, but I'm sure it's sold decently well. well hopefully we'll get with an MPD update next year or next month. Hopefully we'll see <laughs> Nintendo or Sega release, like, or, or at least say something about the Switch sales because it's going to be a, a combined sales across all platforms. Yeah. But right. it, it, it'll be interesting to say, hey, you look, like it actually sold best on Switch. I'm like, that wouldn't surprise me, uh-huh. uh, despite the fact that Switch doesn't have as many units out there because... Uh, <laughs> It's I the only say, portable one with it, it. It's the only portable one, yeah. and there's nothing that visually stunning about it that you would say, I need to have that PlayStation 4 Pro so I can have it in 4K. Yeah. Because right. it, it does have yeah. 4K on PlayStation 4. But it's like, yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. Uh, but most people would rather be like, I can have it in 1080p dock, or I can just take it with me anywhere. Right. Like, mm-hmm. like it's such an appealing factor. And I think if Nintendo puts all their focus in that, I don't, I'm starting to think it's not so crazy the Switch could hit 100 million. Hit more than 100 million. I mean, is it going to be like a DS? I don't know. We've never seen a Nintendo ever focus everything on a single system. And I think right. that's why I'm now in the ballpark. Like, I used to be, oh, just kill the 3DS off when it makes financial sense. I think it already makes financial sense because it's already quarter to quarter, month to month, outselling the 3DS in almost every territory. Game wise, it's starting to outsell the 3DS. And that, we're going to get into that in the next topic. Uh, yes. 
everything's already swinging the Switch's way for where they should be pushing it as hard as they can. Now, I get it. There's a legacy. We do know that Pokemon Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon, they're also going to come out. That's going to push 3DS sales. It might even make it sell more than it, the Switch this holiday because that's just the power of Pokemon. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. But then Pokemon's going to Switch, and uh-huh. the power of Pokemon's going to affect Switch as well. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it might affect Switch in a way that we've never seen before because... An HD Pokemon game. It's never happened. Uh-huh. Not a mainline yeah. game. So yeah, was there, that, there was something that... on Wii. It was like Poka Park or something lame. <laughs> <laughs> Poke, Poke, See, like yeah. I think another thing that'll boost the sales of the Switch is, as I've mentioned many times, Nintendo always comes out with a revised version sure. of whatever console they have, especially if it's a handheld console. They had yep. four or five different versions of the DS and the 3DS. Yep. So whenever the next version of the Switch comes out, whatever it may be, whether it's just a different colored Switch or has a crazy design on it, more memory, whatever the case may be, Whenever they do that, people that already own a Switch, that may be enough for them to be like, oh, well, maybe it's time I buy a second Switch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Actually, I yeah. think the Switch is, is the yeah. first, you know, partially home console they've had that is primed for a mid-gen refresh, like we've seen even this last gen with the PlayStation 4 and now the Xbox One with the Xbox One X coming out. Because really two, th- well, a few things. One, there are some known issues with the switch uh not anything that's like game breaking or 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 you know destroys it in general but you know some people are getting their switches bent because they're overheating i now notice with my switch after doing my battery bank test and having it running for 15 hours straight now my fan makes a little noise which means one of the ball bearings Mm -hmm. broke one of the fins might be bent i don't know what happened it just sat there i didn't even touch it so i don't know how it happened it just did it on its own probably from too much heat right so Mm uh so there's the heat issue that might, I'm not saying this affects everyone. Of course, it doesn't affect everyone. It's also going to be reliant on what the ambient heat is in the rooms you're playing in, where you live, yada, yada, yada. So, like, Bendigate doesn't affect everyone. It, in fact, it probably affects a very small percentage, probably less than 2% of the total audience. But it is an issue uh, that can turn mm-hmm. consumers off. Uh, there's, you know, the issue that some people have had with the left Joy-Con. Now, I know that I think that's been corrected. I don't think anyone who, who's bought one from June on has had this issue. Uh, and Nintendo does fix it for free. But still, the fact that... Nintendo has to publicly say they have to fix this for free. They have to do this. And on top of that, you have the fact that, yes, all all your, all your other competition in the gaming field is moving beyond what the Switch can do in, in a lot of respects. It already was beyond, and now it's moving way beyond. And people are willing to sacrifice to a point for portable, but are they willing to sacrifice entirely for a portable console? And so... Right. What also leads to, to, you know, besides maybe needing some new redesign choices with the cooling and stuff, is the fact that the X2 just released recently in a single product, the Tegra X2. The Tegra X2 is built on the exact same architecture as the Tegra X1, but it's more powerful than the Tegra X1. So give it two years, it might be cheap enough. Uh, and it, supposedly this is like a 10-year partnership, so you can't tell me they're trying to try to seriously run the Nintendo Switch for a decade. Without without a, right. without an upgrade right. or a refresh, <laughs> yeah. so the Tegra X2 running on the same architecture is perfect for a mid gen refresh, where they could they could drop you know say, and I've talked about this before, drop the dock on the original Switch, sell it at two hundred dollars, bring out a new system at three hundred dollars, uh, like Switch Two or the they'll probably call it the new Nintendo Switch because they're addicted yeah. to that new name. Yeah, probably <laughs> new yeah. Super Mario Brothers U, new Nintendo Switch. Anyways, so they release that. And that has the Tegra X2. It's more powerful. It might not be able to do 4K gaming, but it could say 4K Netflix, uh, 4K. You know, it can have a 4K output, is what I'm saying. So it could up the 4K, but games are never going to be made of 4K, right? It'll just up 4K. Well, I, like Xbox I think One there's S, a handful like of, like, indie games that it would probably sure. be able to run in 4K. I don't think they're going to do that, though. It's not going to be no. running, like, Mario Odyssey. Because, because it has to run through a battery, I don't think they're going to do that. I think they would, they would do it, like... You know, like the Xbox One S, right? It doesn't actually give you 4K gaming. It up your games to 4K. Right. Um, which sometimes mm. does a better job than your TVs because you, all your 4K TVs up all your 4 gaming to 4K, but they don't always do a very good job, uh, which is why there's all these devices that exist to up everything. 
so I think it could do that for especially for streaming and obviously it could up res for games, but it's it's still gonna be native 1080p that's up res to 4K if you have a 4K. But and and that's not gonna say it's as powerful as a PlayStation 4 or even or a PlayStation 4 Pro or an Xbox One X. Of course not. But it could make it more comparable, uh, give third parties enough power that they feel like because games a lot what a lot of people forget when we look at third party games is very rarely, unless they are exclusive to a platform, are they built in a way that they're not scalable, right? So when Naughty Dog mm-hmm. builds a game exclusively for PlayStation 4, of course that game's not built to scale because mm-hmm. it's built for uh, it's built for right now two specific platforms, PlayStation 4 Pro and PlayStation 4. So it's not going to be able to scale down correctly to PlayStation 3. Of course not. It wasn't built for that platform. But mm-hmm. for games that are cross-platform, uh, let's take more, more so ones that also come out on PC. So let's take as an example one that is coming to Switch, NBA 2K18. That comes out on Xbox One, it comes out on PlayStation 4, it comes out on PC, it comes out on Switch. It's a game that the engine is built in a way to scale. And you have to, any game that comes out on PC, your engine has to be built that way because you've got to account for the multitude. You have to account for the $200 netbooks and the $3,000 you know, gaming rigs out there that people go nuts right. with. Uh, mm-hmm. So they, they have to account for all this. So usually that means the top end consumer is not really going to ever get the best possible game they possibly can because they're not going to push it that far. But right. it also means that every the, the general consumer of games on PCs will be able to play it. So when you consider that, there are some PC games of third party games right now that if you look at it and you're looking at the visuals, you're looking at the FPS, you're looking at the lack of anti-aliasing, you're looking at this stuff and you're like, Okay, so I can run this on low settings, and it looks like a freaking N64 game. You're going to tell me that I can't run on Switch? Right. It <laughs> can probably run better looking than that on Switch. Uh, and, you know, X1 architecture is very similar to PC architecture. It's supposedly easy to port. So, with a mid-gen refresh, one, because it's built on the same architecture as the X1, that's fully backwards compatible right away without any effort. All the old Switch games work on it. So... That's perfect for a mid-gen refresh. It's perfect for a new 3DS type thing where all the old games work. There's no no patches, no nothing. It just works. Uh, where mm-hmm. now like, you get Xbox One X, you want to take full advantage. You got to download the 4K pack. No, no, it just works. No no if, ands, or buts. You just put your cartridge in, it works just like the original Switch. You can make you Then you can make games that now scale depending on which Switch you use, just like for which PlayStation. You know, when you buy a PlayStation 4 game, you're not buying the PlayStation 4 Pro version of the game. You're just buying the PlayStation 4 game. Works on both different resolutions, different FPS on depending on which platform you have it on. And now they can do that with Switch. Yep. Uh, and so the game could still, it might be fully optimized for for Switch 2 or new Nintendo Switch, but it still works with the original Switch. So you're not kicking people like us that were day one to the curb. Of course, I, I would totally buy the new Nintendo Switch anyways. Um, especially, <laughs> I mean, if I find out it's going to exist, I'm going to be like, I'm sorry, Switch. Um, if your if new Nintendo Switch is coming out December, I'm selling you now, and I could probably get all my money back still. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Even though the restocks haven't been better uh, this week. This past week's been crazy. It feels like every retailer in the U.S. Got, suddenly got Switches this week. Yeah. All GameStop retailers which, got it. Speaking of which, that leads into specified. some sales numbers. Oh, it does, doesn't it? The MPD <laughs> is officially in. Uh, I did a video on this earlier in the week, uh, and it was on the leak. And the leak basically gave us, said the Switch was number one with 277,000 units. So I don't know where that number came from because now the MPD is out. We don't have any sales numbers. We just know the Switch is number one. Uh, and, and the Splatoon 2 is number one. That was confirmed. But there's some interesting things out nice. of the MPD that I feel like we should talk about um, that also might speak towards this, the previous topic. Well, how do we play our Switch? And, you know, uh, so Splatoon 2 is the number one selling game, period. Uh, they beat our all multi-platform mm-hmm. games. Everything. There, there was not a single huh. game in, in North America in July that sold better than Splatoon 2. And didn't that come late in the month, too? Oh, man. When did Splatoon 2 come out? I was, it was like the 21st or something, wasn't it? I really don't remember. Google it feels like quick. I've been playing it for a while, but we've only... I had feel like it was. Yeah. I, we're, only, we're only entering our second Splatfest now, so... Because yeah. I think it was around the... July 14th. 21st. Yeah, yep. July yeah. 21st. So Just... it only has, like, what, 10 days of sales? Um, yeah. yeah. Craziest number one in ten days, and we know it was going to be number one in Japan. That's great, whatever. Of course, Japan loves Splatoon too, but like for it to take number one in North America is huge. Uh-huh. Um, what's mm-hmm. even more surprising, Breath of the Wild was number five for July. Huh. Mario Kart Eat Deluxe, number seven. Impressive. Three of the top ten best-selling software titles in like all of North America for the month of July were 
strictly Nintendo Switch only games. Mm-hmm. Now, is this you just going to a bunch of different stores or what? MPD? No. What? It, it was a joke. Saying that you were the one buying all the different oh, oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. I think it flew over all of our heads. <laughs> and I gotta throw this out there because I feel like this is also interesting. Number 17 was ARMS. So not bad. New uh, IP. So we know that a new IP was still in the top 20 selling games a month later, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. so good for ARMS. We don't know what that means. We don't know what the total sales units are. We obviously and this doesn't include any digital sales, so the sales are usually actually even higher. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say, where did it where did it peak at? Well, the first month we know it sold 1.2 million. Okay. That was announced by Nintendo. There was no, at the time of recording this, Nintendo hasn't said anything about the MPD yet. Okay. So we don't know any updates on the ARM sales. We don't know updates on Mario Kart 8, Zelda, or Splatoon 2. We're really surprised that, you know, with Splatoon 2 taking number one, that they didn't really suppress at least telling us how, how good it sold. Because usually when you're number one, you like to tout. Right, right. right. So usually you'd hear, this is how many Switches sold, this is how many, but they didn't say anything. Uh, they I might just wonder be, if it's performing under their expectations um well you have to remember this is july so it was still hard to get the switch right uh yeah and even even to this day it really wasn't that easy to get a switch until now for the first time since launch i walked into three different stores this week and all three had a switch in stock and i knew awesome. there were all knew these restocks were happening there was all the reports toys the rest are restocking walmart's restocking best buy restock all GameStop, GameStop stores are restocking so clearly there was a huge shipment that came out to north america uh-huh. probably after they felt like they caught up well enough in japan which i don't know how they caught up well enough in japan <laughs> they haven't they're, they're still yeah, having no. <laughs> they're still having lotteries and stuff i whatever yay north america we're we're getting a, a, it's now is the time to buy a switch because who knows if this supply chain is going to stay this way um, right. I'm surprised it's right, actually right. not all going to Japan since they have Monster Hunter Double Cross coming out now too. Um, mm. So they should really be gearing up. But maybe they think, you know, maybe they're thinking ahead. Well, Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle just might be a, a big deal this this month, which I hope it is. Mm-hmm. But we I don't do. know. Uh, maybe maybe they're hoping. Yeah. May, maybe they want to show. Maybe this is a sign. I, I know this is speculating, but maybe they're trying to tell. Uh, 2K, hey, look, we want to get as many units out to consumers in North America as we can for your NBA game. Uh-huh. We want to show you that we're not just doing this for our games. Uh-huh. Let, let's do this for your game, too. And granted, that comes out like September 15th, but still, having the, the owners now is going to increase the chances of that thing selling better. Uh-huh. So we'll see. So I think, well, it's number one in July, obviously, because Splatoon 2 was number one, and I think that's why Zelda and Mario Kart were high, too, because... New Switch owners went, out, went and bought Zelda, went and bought Mario Kart, uh, and maybe went and bought ARMS. I don't know. Yeah. But I think it also shows that when you move into next month, it'll be very interesting now that I am consciously aware that at least as of the middle of August, there is enough Switch units out there that I'm now starting to see them on shelves. That means you're starting to slowly catch up to demand. And if you're catching up to the demand, that's when you start seeing what the real demand is for the thing. Is that 277,000 in July? Is that, that that that's rumored? Is that? I mean, that's good. That that's good. Period. I mean, that's what PlayStation Four sells 200,000 units every single month all the time, and everyone talks about how awesome that is. So that, those the, the, right. that's, kidder, that's yeah. really good numbers in the middle yeah. in the middle of summer, a non-holiday period, which Switch has never even had a holiday period yet, and it's probably well, we know for sure it's definitely over five million units. It's probably you know, because the last time they updated that was at the end of the first quarter. You know, we're like a month or month and a half or so after that. So they've obviously sold over five million. They're probably closer to six, Did maybe seven know? by now. Uh, it's, it's crazy what they're doing because none of this includes the craziest Splatoon two numbers. Uh, Which, by the way, that's about half the total Wii U sales lifetime. Yes. Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. And Whoa. the system's been on the market how long? Yeah. So. Yeah. Then- a March. little over five, a little over five months. Six months. Yeah, it's about probably. five and a half months. Somewhere yeah. in the area. Yeah. So we're reaching the half the halfway point of the first year the Switch has been on the market, and it's probably already sold at least half of the total of the Wii U did in four years. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep, that's crazy, and that's what's so cool about this MPD is the month before Nintendo was number two. It was right. PlayStation Four number one. Now Nintendo and wasn't that far behind. Too, right? Yeah. And, the, and that was the month ARMS came out. And Nintendo wasn't that far behind, but it felt like those numbers were supply constrained, right? Mm-hmm. And they probably naturally increased supply for Splatoon 2's launch because they know Splatoon was going to sell probably better than ARMS uh, mm-hmm. just because it has a following already. Mm-hmm. So then you come into this month, I'm really interested to see with the big Switch game this month, at least, being 
just Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Metal, which I, I, as much as I love it, I don't know how it's going to sell. Because that, well, and it's a third party game, technically. Technically. Right? It's Ubisoft. a crossover, like Fire Emblem Warriors. Um, as much as, like, it's created by a third party, but it's in partnership with Nintendo, if that makes right, sense. Right, yeah. So I don't really count it as a true third party game until it's, like, an actual third party exclusive game. Yeah. Not, not like, oh, yeah, we're, we're making you a Dynasty Warriors game, but we're crossing it over with Fire Emblem. It's like, okay, well, how well would an actual Dynasty Warriors game sell? Probably not that well, to be honest. Real yeah. Dynasty Warriors <laughs> games don't even sell that well, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they do the crossovers, because that's the only way they can sell their games. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Dynasty Warrior makers. Like, I, I don't mean to, to crap all over you, but you guys know it. That's why you they cross over cool One Piece. They were cool once upon a time, and so then like, they made 37 sequels. One Piece and, and Zelda that. and Fire Emblem and the zillions <laughs> of all the crossovers. Yeah. You was, do it for a reason. Was Dynasty Warriors the game that whenever they did the PS3 reveal – PlayStation was like we're focusing on realism and everything, and then there was the giant spider thing. Maybe I don't remember. I don't know. It, it's an old joke or an old meme. Sorry. Yeah, I know. No, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember if it was that. I keep thinking it was Skyrim, but I think it predated Skyrim. I can't remember. Um. Oh, so, so other interesting notes. Uh, besides the fact that the Switch was the top selling platform in July. Uh, Breath of the Wild is the second best-selling game in all of 2017, uh, nice. behind Ghost Recon Wildlands. Again, impressive because it's a console exclusive game. Yep. And the number yep. one game is multi-platform. Yep. yep. And on platforms with many, many millions yes. available consoles. Yes. PC, yeah, Xbox, that's the thing. The Breath of the Wild was on the Wii U, which had less sales than anything, yep. and on the Switch which wasn't able to sell as I mean, much if you, if you look at it, it to this point, we probably still haven't crossed 20 million combined install base between Wii U and Switch. Yeah. And Breath of the Wild, on just with 20 million potential consumers, is the second best-selling game for the whole year over all the other multi-platform games possible yeah. out there. Wow. What's even crazier is Breath of the Wild is now in the top 10 games for the past 12 months. So that, include, that doesn't include August at all, so that includes January through July and then the entire holiday period of last year. So that includes the releases of FIFA and NBA. Impressive. And like all yeah. the Call wow. of Duty. Um, all these games that do continue to have tail. Like, like we even see, if you look at the top 10, top 20 games of this month, you're still seeing like NBA 2K17 is still selling really well, despite the fact 2K18 is coming out in like two, like two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so like mm -hmm. these are games that continue to sell a lot over time. And Breath of the Wild being out for only, you know, not even, a, not even eight months this year. You know, it's all for five and a half months, or at the time of this thing, five months. Yeah. It's already in less than half a year in the top ten for the past 12 months, including a full holiday period that it was not present for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On only 20 yeah. million units. Amazing. That includes, like, Call of Duty, which always... Yes. And yes, a, a lot of the games I mentioned are ahead of it. It's at the number eight spot, so it's not, like, really high on the list. But it wasn't it's on the list before this. still top ten. Yeah, it was That's actually... really impressive. I went back and checked the... As of June, uh, the MPD for June, it was not in the top 10 for the previous 12 months. So I don't know if a game fell off or if because of the, it was number five in sales last month, it, it boosted hmm. it up. That's mm -hmm. probably what happened. I'm assuming that's what happened because uh, nice. I looked back at the month that fell off and I can't think of any games uh, that released that month that would have been a big impact uh, compared to the holiday games. So just really, really cool that uh, I guess... From this, you know, I just spent a lot of time going over this stuff. What do you guys think this means for the future of Switch? I think this is amazing news because it means yeah. that even the Wii U sold out whenever it first launched, as I think yeah. almost every console does. But the fact that the Switch, almost said we, the fact that the Switch <laughs> keeps selling out and there are people that are still actively trying to get one mm -hmm. means that I think as many Switch units as Nintendo is able to put out, especially with the holiday season coming up, because right. right now like they had the launch and then they have the holiday season and then there's that middle gap, which we're mm -hmm. in now. Even in the middle gap, Mm -hmm. where interest shouldn't be as high as it is, it's still selling out. So I think yeah. for the rest of 2017, and this is what I said before the Switch even released, but that was just speculation, I think however many units Nintendo is able to create 
in 2017 is exactly how many they're going to sell. Because a lot of people were mm-hmm. saying, do you think it'll sell 2 million, 5 million, 10 million? How many switches will sell before its first year in 2017 is up? And my answer was always, however many Nintendo can make. If they can make 5 million, they'll obviously sell out. If they make 10 million, they'll sell out. Yeah, and to your point, you know, Nintendo yeah. said that for this fiscal year, which goes through March 2018, they would sell 10 million units this fiscal year. Plus the launch month, that would put it at 12.7 million um, for, I, <laughs> I guess, what almost feels like their first full year on the market. Because mm-hmm. it's really weird that, like, this fiscal year, because uh, that, doesn't, it, that doesn't include the launch month of the Switch, but yet it, it's basically the first 13 months. You know, twelve point seven million units. That that's really good, mm-hmm. uh, especially that's since a lot. Of, especially since we're talking about over half of those sales didn't come during the holidays. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And you know the yeah. holidays are going to be big, and it's really crazy. Even this year, you think, oh, what's the big game for the holidays? Oh, it's Super Mario Odyssey. I'm like, really, it comes out before Halloween. So yeah. I don't even know if they know what their big game is yet. I mean, <laughs> Xenoblade Chronicles Two. Maybe they're trying to hype that up as their big holiday game, or maybe they mm-hmm. just think, you know what? Our library is so huge that when people go out on Black Friday, they see Switch, they're going to see Mario Kart and Mario and Zelda and Arms with 2. They're just going to be like, man, how do I not own the system yet? Yeah. Yeah. Especially places like... uh, Especially since it won't think about it. It also, because of when they released it in March, there is a potential they could run actual Black Friday deals on it and knock $50 off the price and include a game. That would be so cool. Because they normally don't do that. No, they don't, especially in the first year. But because it released it early in the year, they can be like, "Look, it's been on the market long enough. Let's run a Black mm-hmm. Friday deal. Let, let's let's sell it for two fifty with a game, especially a yeah, game that's been out. Never had a price drop but in like, like four uh, years. Imagine if they straight. did two fifty with Zelda for the holidays. Yeah, yeah because and, by that point, oh, here's Eric. Zelda would be like the oldest game on the Switch. Eric, yes, Eric yeah. looks yeah. distressed. <laughs> they, they, uh, what was it? The make you feel bad for games a new one. like Ocarina of Time 3D and Wind Waker HD. They released those as like twenty dollar games on the Wii and 3DS. So, like yeah. doing it with Breath of the Wild because they'll still be able to make money from people who got Breath of the Wild for free because they might be interested in buying the DLC. Yeah, there's the DLC right. plus the plus you look at. One, it's already one of the best-selling games of the year. Two, everyone's going to know what that game is, at least, because in the gaming community, it's been continually talked about as one of the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you buy that system, and then all of a sudden you see, oh, but look at all these other great games. So I can get the greatest game, one of the greatest games of this year, maybe Game of the Year, for 250 plus I can get Mario Odyssey that's probably going to compete for Game of the Year. Uh, I don't think Splatoon 2 is going to compete for Game of the Year, but it's still really, really good. You might be willing to check it out. Uh, you know, you might w- wonder what ARMS is about. Maybe you want Skyrim on the go. Uh, there, there's a lot. Certainly, if if they can do a Black Friday deal like that, I don't know if they can, but if they could, it would be very interesting to me to see how that could impact. Because reality is PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, the base units, could literally be $200 on Black Friday. Yeah, very possibly. So, like, for Nintendo to be like, yeah, you can get those for 200 with, like, four games, or you can get Nintendo Switch for 300 with no games. <laughs> <laughs> or a system yeah. that's not as powerful, and, you know, employees in GameStop will consistently remind you it's not as powerful, or say it's for kids or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, think... but you can get, dude, did you know, like, why would you get a Switch for 300 and no games when you can go get this Xbox One for your kid and get Minecraft for free, and this for free, and this for free, and this game for free with it, with a controller, for two hundred dollars on Black Friday, well, I think it's entirely possible Nintendo does some deluxe or limited time bundle to where you get the Switch, the Joy Cons, a Pro controller, and one game. That Exciting way, it needs to be bundle. Like you could sell it we're, as we're, more. We're, we're talking about bundles. Isn't there a certain bundle coming exclusively to Walmart? Oh yeah, I seen Splatoon two orders. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say I seen pre orders for it the is, Splatoon two. It is the I believe what I read the game comes with it because it's the same one from Japan. So that would be the first ever bundled in game. That's probably mm-hmm. a digital code. Uh, bundled in game that's a themed quote unquote theme system. They just colored the Joy Cons, but 
that's just Pretty. that's just oh, Nintendo. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, it's weird too because like it's Nintendo's official first themed system of like their own thing, but then you have like Monster Hunter Double Cross coming out, and there's like a bundle in Japan that literally put like an exclusive pattern on the docks, and it looks just, yeah looks badass. And I'm like, why isn't it okay? Awesome. So if this third party <laughs> company can get that, why isn't Nintendo doing this? Yeah, right. Why mm-hmm. isn't there by now in the middle of summer a Zelda bundle that has yeah, like right. a theme thing to? It? And that might piss mm-hmm. people off, but Trust me, I'll I'll trade in my Switch and get a Zelda one if it exists. It'll happen. Well, plus it helps the trading value of the Switch is stupid high right now. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's, it's going to remain that high if they're catching up the demand, but still. Uh, right, right. What, what did you have to say, Eric? I can tell you, you um, got something right there. Yeah. I, the only reason why I could see them not doing a Black Friday deal is because they know they can sell. If they haven't caught up to demand, they know they can sell it at the 300 Sure. They, they don't have to cut yeah. it. No, they don't. So, I mean, it it might be smart for them to do it, but they don't have to because if, if the demand's still there. Well, I look at it as – I look at it as if – if the demand is as high as it really is, uh, we're talking about a Black Friday deal. So we're talking about a one-day only – maybe maybe a two-day. Maybe they also do it on Cyber Monday on Amazon or something. Right. Sure. But if it's just that one-day deal, I think they're willing to jump in it because you're only committing so many units to that $250 price point. Right, right. And it mm-hmm. makes you look competitive with everybody else. Even right. if, yeah, you can get more games with them, you're not getting a potential game of the year with them. You're right. getting older games. Uh, so, and, and plus, you know that Sony and PlayStation are going to be pushing PlayStation 4 Pro. There are one terabyte consoles that are more expensive. Xbox One X is coming out this holiday. Right. So, they have they have their own issues that can overshadow those cheaper systems where Nintendo can be like, look, for a single day, you can get this. And if it sells out, and you already know it's been immensely popular and selling out, don't worry. We're going to consistently restock it for the rest of the holidays. And a majority of what they sell over the holidays then would be three hundred dollars. No, game. right, right. But they could do something like they did move. with the Amazon on Black Friday, where they got an exclusive Amazon new 3DS with uh, Super Mario Land uh, on it, Super Mario World, uh, sure. the SNES game on it. It was like a hundred dollar bundle on Black Friday only, only on Amazon. And when the quantities were gone, they were gone. They yeah. could do something like that. Yeah, that, yeah, and that's kind of what I'm looking at. If they just do it as a one day or, or like a one day in store, one day online thing, uh, I feel like it's okay because the majority of their sales still are going to be at the 300 no game. And the only thing that that bothers, the only thing that Nintendo has to realize if they did that though, however, is after this holiday, next year if they're going to keep it at 300. Because you did a deal 250 with a game, you're going to have mm-hmm. to start doing 300 with a game. You're going to have to start bundling in games in 2018. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Um, kind of like how the deluxe Wii U became the standard Wii U yeah. after a while. And that's the thing. And that's why I, I feel like the Zelda bundle at 250, uh, you know, including the game, you know, they could bring that back at 300, including the game in 2018. Because then you're talking about long tail sales and DLCs behind you, but the DLC is not included. So you still have to buy the DLC if mm-hmm. you want it. And, you know, now anyone who doesn't own a Switch or couldn't get one this year still realizes, oh, now I'm paying 300 but I still get Zelda. That's really cool. It's That cost Nintendo nothing at that point. Zelda's already made money for them. Oh, yeah. Um, right. And, you know, it, and if they're really serious about Z- the Zelda being the best-selling Zelda they've ever made, well, you bundle it in after this year. It's yes. probably going to be the best-selling Zelda game ever made just because of bundles. You right. got to push it as far as possible at that point. Oh, it sold three you know, times and, and as even, well as and, our best and, one. And, ever. and that wouldn't even have to be the only one. Like, say, you know, arms sales fell off a cliff. They could have a bundle that has arms in it now. Right. With the, the arms theme control. They could, have, they could they bring could the have Splatoon a... 2 bundle back. Uh, they, they could just start bundling games and giving people options. Bundle Mario Odyssey by summer at right. some point. Or by the next holiday season, have a Mario Odyssey yeah, right. bundle at 250 again. And just yeah, keep, keep repeating this. It'd be really cool to have, like, a, a dock that has the. Basically, looks like a Mario hat. Oh. Like Mario's hat. Oh. Like it took over your dock. Oh yeah, that, that would be awesome. That would be sick. That would be sick. Like, hey, hey, Nintendo. Yeah, work on right? that. We're giving you. That. Maybe they already <laughs> Again. have that. Maybe they, Again. Who knows? Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, what could happen? You know, obviously we don't know, right? This is all predicting. But I feel like Nintendo is is they're set up so well they could do anything. They, they could not do it and get away with it for this year. I think they could not do a price reduction, not do a bundled in game, and because of the lineup. Because of the demand, they'll get away with it. Uh-huh. I just mm-hmm. feel like uh, it gives Nintendo a reason to try to think they can get away with it again next year. And one, we don't know what any of the lineup is. We know some games are coming next year. We don't know when. Uh, right now, 
unless Metroid and Pokemon are both landing next year, which it sounds like Pokemon is definitely not landing next year. And the fact that we haven't seen Metroid Prime at all tells us Metroid Prime is probably not landing next year either. Uh, that means the, the, the two so. the two games that people are most hyped for aren't going to be there. They're going to be 2019. Yeah. So you start looking at 2018, mm-hmm. and obviously there's games you don't know about. You know, we have no idea what retro studios are doing. We have no idea what like over half of Nintendo studios are doing right now. So obviously right. there could be a strong a strong lineup again in 2018. But it's hard to imagine a stronger lineup in 2018 than this year when you have one of the best Zelda games ever made, potentially one of the best Mario games ever made, plus you had Mario Kart. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you could have Smash Hit next year, but you're not going to get Mario Kart. One of the best Mario's, one of the best Zelda's to probably ever happen again this generation. Mm-hmm. So right. you already know your 2018 lineup, unless it's like had Pokemon at the end and somehow had Metroid Prime in the beginning. It's probably not going to be able to come close to 2017. So I, yeah. that's why I so like the 250 it. bundle idea because I feel like that sets Nintendo up to bundle games in next year and still justify the $300 price point. Uh, whereas now, if they just coast this year keep making the $300 per unit, which they can get away with, it, they're going to make them think, okay, we can do that in 2018, and then hype start, start like dialing back a little bit, as everyone who wanted, who felt like I needed to buy this to play these games, now that you don't see any games on the horizon they're interested in in 2018, that doesn't mean there's not going to be good games, right? There's going to be. But like the huge hype games that I need to own in a system to play it might not be there. So you look at that, and you're like, all these good games are coming out. We're getting more Splatoon-type games, more ARMS-type games, but that's not games that people outside of Japan really won't really, I need to buy it for. Right. So I feel like, I almost feel like it would be a mistake if they didn't do a bundle. Or even if they just do a $300 for the game, set themselves up to do something in 2018 that's better value for consumers than it is right now in 2017. 2017, it's, we need to make as many as we can. 2018, I think it needs to be, now we need to start adding more value to that three hundred dollar price point. Mm-hmm. Heck, maybe mm-hmm. really, you know, I, this is just my dream. Don't include a game, but release. I mean, it's okay to not include a game, but then include the name Pro Controller. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Seventy dollars yes. added value to your three hundred dollar price point. Anyone who wants to use a traditional home console that's been holding back because they didn't want to spend seventy bucks now doesn't have an excuse. Right. Um, I could also even see him going with a with a bundled like amiibo, even instead of a game. Sure, sure. Ooh. They've done that with Wii U. Uh, I think there was a Mario Maker amiibo bundle, bundle mm-hmm. that had Mario Maker game with mm-hmm. the amiibo for it. Right. Yes. Yep. Sure did. And it was the only way you could get the um, modern colored uh, eight bit Mario. Which of course for collectors sucks because you got to buy a whole new Wii U. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't have the, it. The, there's nothing special <laughs> about the system, but yes, the only way you can get the amiibo. Um, I mean, you can get it secondhand, but it probably costs you almost more than the system did. Right. <laughs> right so you right. might as well buy the system and resell the system and get some money back. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I I don't know. It'll be interesting. You know, again, this is a, an ongoing conversation. I think we're going to continue to have about Switch sales and where it could lead to because we're in unknown territory. Again, if this turns out to be a platform that we find out in 2018, Nintendo has all their teams working on uh, for the first time in Nintendo's history on a single platform. We don't know what they're thinking. Um, I just see a path here where I feel like this would be the best way to continue potentially even bigger sales year in 2018 despite not having Mario and Zelda. Because now people in 2018 feel like they're getting the value of Mario and Zelda for less than people paid in 2017. But, uh, again, that's just me. I don't know what Nintendo's thinking. Maybe they have some crazy game up their sleeves. Maybe I'm sure they do. Maybe they somehow, yep. somehow, I don't know, I mean... It would cost them like half their company, but they Call of Duty's exclusive to the Switch next year. It would piss a lot of people off, but it would also yeah. sell a shitload yeah, of Switches. Would. It would. Um, Maybe an exclusive game, but not the main. Well, that's what I'm saying. It would cost yeah. Nintendo billions of dollars. Oh, yeah. I would be too, so expensive. It wouldn't feasibly. But I'm just saying, a game of that impact that we just don't know is going to come. In. Um, right. You know, maybe we find out that Beyond Good and Evil 2 is hit and switch and is coming to it first and is landing next year, mm-hmm. um, which is yeah. what some rumors have suggested. I mean, yeah. that would be huge. Or, it, or even it's like a couple month exclusive, like it yeah. was like it was for Mario Run with with uh, Apple. Yeah, yeah, uh, like right. ju- just something like that. And I know I, I'm not saying that I actually approve of. I don't like timed exclusives. Right. I've I've always been vocally against it, so it feels weird yeah. saying Nintendo should get a timed exclusive, but I'm like. 
But at the same point, this is why they matter for the companies because they want that time to exclusive to drive consumers, which makes sense when you're building a base. I think when now nowadays, like when you're PlayStation 4, you don't have a timed exclusive on, say, the game, right? Like everyone's getting Destiny 2 at the same time, but you have, you have exclusive content and timed exclusive DLC. It's like, why? Yeah. How is that a benefit to gamers again? You already are the market leader. Does it, are people going to, <laughs> are like, I don't know anyone who's, about, man, I got to buy that PlayStation 4 because it has that exclusive DLC. It's like, no, you just already own a PlayStation 4, so that's what you buy it on. Yeah. Uh, it's... Mm-hmm. I, it's a practice I understand when you're in the Switch's position. Maintaining momentum and keeping it going. PlayStation 4 has got no problem maintaining momentum. It doesn't need this kind of Yeah, but Destiny, anymore. I think, was instrumental in the earlier days of the PS4. They did have that awesome white Destiny bundle. Sure, sure. And the advertising was heavily focused more sure. on Sony than on any other platform. Well, Sony Taco paid, Bell so, had Sony a giant up. campaign for it and everything. <laughs> Sony so ponied. Like it did have some hand in its success. Sony ponied up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but and that did. made that made sense back then. As I said, mm-hmm. when you're trying to build a platform and maintain yep. success in the early days, I get it. I don't like it. I do, I think yep. it's completely anti-consumer. But at least I understand from a business side. Right. Now, but now, when you're this far into the generation, it's like okay, you can stop now. Like, mm-hmm. like, I, I mean, yeah. they're not going to. This is yeah, Sony right. that won't allow crossplay because they don't want people <laughs> playing on with Xbox players. Yeah, or something. Oh no, it's, it's like the children. Right. Yeah, gotta gotta protect the children in a game primarily targeted <laughs> at children. Right. So protect the children from themselves. I mean, I guess I understand, <laughs> but but it's also like you're you're basically saying Microsoft can't protect kids. I I, it, I don't I don't get it. They oh they own Minecraft. I mean, yeah. It'd be different if they were like telling Nintendo, "Hey, we don't trust you to protect kids," which sounds really weird, right? Right. Because <laughs> Nintendo's most protective of children, but it's like yeah. this is the company that owns the game. Yeah. Well, they already technically control it, anyways. They just want to bring all the players together. They already control the community on PlayStation Four. It, it's just a really poor excuse to say we don't want to sell a yeah. Microsoft game. Yeah. It will. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone knows the logical reason for that is because. Sony wants Sony gamers playing with Sony players. Yeah. They, they want it to be, oh, you want you want to play Minecraft with your buddies on a PlayStation 4? If, and you own an Xbox One? Too bad. You better go buy a PlayStation 4. I get it. I, that's the real reasoning. Mm-hmm. It's just a bullshit reason when you're the market leader and people are already favoring your system anyways. And they're cross-play with, P- or with PC. Yeah, and they do cross-play with PC. Uh. What? It's Probably a, the least secure platform. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's crazy. Right, you right. cross play with PC, but you can't cross play with Xbox, which owns the PC market. Yep. Um, so we already technically work with them, but nope. <laughs> and, you know, and if, it, and if they're trying to say Nintendo can't protect children, I don't... Ooh, 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 Nintendo might have something to say about that. Um, whose account yep. system got hacked and all the credit card information got out? It wasn't Nintendo's. Uh, was. Granted, granted, the, the, yeah. the counterpoint is Nintendo doesn't really have a true account system, so that. <laughs> <laughs> but they have a parental control app for their system. What other system has that? I don't know. They might have parental control apps. I've never looked. Is it an official first party though? Well, because Nintendo's assume, like advertising it in it the early be. days of the Switch. Oh, parents, yeah, use no, this app and you can you know there, shut there off are, the system after a certain there amount of time. There are apps. For the Xbox One and PlayStation Four, uh, I can't test them right now. But it, you know, if I get an Xbox One and PlayStation Four in the future, I might download them and just see uh, what they, how robust they really are. Um, and are they first party? They are first party apps. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So they have apps. I don't know whether or not they like. It's kind of like the Nintendo Switch Online app. It's just a general app for the whole system. Oh, so it's so, not parental control. Well, it might have parental, parental, parental control. It might have parental control. Separate. Well, I know, but it might have parental controls within the app. I can look um, at it now. I actually think parental, the Nintendo Switch parental control app should just be combined with the normal app. I, yeah, honestly. I don't know why we need two apps. It's, that, that's what, And th- those systems might actually have that. I don't know. I know those systems do have parental controls. Like, they do exist. They're there. When you set up the system, it asks you mm-hmm. about parental controls. Mm-hmm. So it's like the, the systems have it, uh, and that's kind of the thing. It's like, okay, so you don't trust Microsoft to protect children. But they have parental controls just like you do. Yeah. And it's like, oh, but more kids swear on Xbox. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of the reputation, but I play games, multiplayer games on play, uh, PlayStation 4. Let me tell you, I don't think I've heard so many cuss words come out of an eight year old in my life than when I play. I, oh I, I think kids swear on mine. It has to do with the no game. Matter what it's about, it's about which game you're playing, yeah. not the platform. You know, honestly, yeah. as a live streamer, I can say that. 
usually it's the adults that are much better uh, with clean language than any of the young kids. It's insane. I mean, I'm not going to say I don't get passionate sometimes. I lost a game of Madden once and because of right. bullshit fucking fumble when I was trying to run out the goddamn clock and the guy picked up a turn for touchdown. I was like, fuck. But I'm like, I was mad at me. I wasn't mad at the guy. Yeah. Right. So it's like, right. and he knew that. Like, oh, that sucks, man. I'm like, what do you mean it sucks? It rocks for you. I'd be excited as hell if I were you. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you didn't even hit stick me. My guy just fumbled. Yeah. Randomly just decided, you know what? I'm going to juke him and drop the ball. Thank you. He didn't even touch me. You just looked oh, at me funny. No, I think I did get hit, but it wasn't yeah. even a big hit. I don't know. But, yeah, it's it's a very interesting thing. So, speaking a little bit about third-party stuff, I believe 5J had a topic. You, yes. you want to uh, bring up your topic, bro? Sure. Yeah, so uh, just this week, Sonic Mania hit on PS4, Xbox One, PC, and Nintendo Switch. And uh, already there's been amazing reviews for it, and it seems to be universally lauded. In fact, Sega themselves tweeted out that uh, it's now the highest rated Sonic game in the last 15 years. And uh, that's insane. One reason that's insane is because it is not a first party developed game. It was developed by three fan studios, third party studios. And then officially backed by Sega and supported by Sega, but it was not a Sega-born game. Yeah. Again, proof that the fans sometimes know how to better make your games good again than the yeah. actual first-party studio. But. So uh, first I looked up what the other top uh, Sonic games were just to see you know, what were ranked better. And uh, on Metacritic, Sonic Mania ranks between 85 and 89%, depending on the console. Switch having the best rating at 89%. Nice. Yeah, so that's Sweet. great. The other top three games that are around the same or better score were Sonic Adventure 2 at 89% as well, Sonic Advance at 87%, and Sonic the Hedgehog 2 at 87%. Amazing. So I, I had two parts here. Do you guys play Sonic games, and what do you think of them? And have you tried Sonic Mania? What do you guys think? And that's uh, part one, and then we'll get to part two later. So first off, I... Have not played Sonic Mania. I yeah. want it bad. I don't have the money, and it's hard for me right now because when I do have some money next week, I am probably going to get the Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. But mm, I, I sure. want this. I want this bad. There was actually a, a temporary thing that you, if you switched your account to Russian, you could I could have bought it for ten bucks off the Russian Ooh. eShop. Switch back to US, and the Russian version includes. English translation. Hmm. So uh, I could have got it for $10. I decided against doing that, even though it's not illegal. That's the, that, that this is actually one of the beauties of region free is that digital wise, you can basically get the cheapest version of a game period. Yeah. As long as it has the correct language for you. Um, right. And so that's great. So I, I won't even have to feel guilty doing it. I just didn't have 10 bucks. So, so, that's, so that's I couldn't Sonic do it. And, uh, what about the rest of the Sonic series so, for you? Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. I really want to play Sonic Mania. My hype levels are... I haven't been this hype for a Sonic game in a long time. Oh, really quick. Uh, I could have spent uh, $20 on it, but I decided to grab this monstrosity instead, so now I can do this. <laughs> yes. So that's that was, important. I was waiting for this. It is. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Nate. Uh, that was worth it just for that. Yeah. Um, right? <laughs> but that's a, this should, hey, Edward, that's the rest of the podcast. Just constantly yeah. repeat that segment. Yep. Um, no, it, I, I, obviously I have a love hate relationship with Sonic. I think any Sonic fan has a love hate relationship because yeah. they, we've been dragged through the mud a lot. Uh, it hasn't been like with Mario where if you get that Mario game, you don't like, like, Oh, you don't like new Super Mario Brothers. You it's okay. You had Super Mario Galaxy, Super Mario Galaxy 2. Now you have Super Mario Odyssey. You're going to keep getting that, that treatment from Nintendo like every five years or so, it's going to happen. You know it. You know what's coming. Just like with Zelda. Oh, you didn't like Triforce Heroes, but you know Breath of the Wild was coming. Uh, yep. With Sonic, it's like, oh, you, you didn't like... Uh, what was that? What was that one made with a big red button? Just terrible. Um, Sonic was 6? No. No, <laughs> no. no it, it's uh, uh, the most recent Sonic release. Um, Sonic Boom? Sonic Boom. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, Boom. So Fire like, and Ice. Oh, you didn't, you didn't like Sonic Boom. You didn't know anything good was coming. Because that's just what Sonic has been. And not consistently, right? Because 
I it's also it's a love hate. I love some of the Sonic games that are really Sonic Generation, Sonic Colors, like those games. I didn't love them as much as the old school Sonic games, but at least it felt like Sonic was going in the right direction, right? Um, and had the potential to get better. And then they threw that all out the window. Uh, <laughs> you know, Sonic 06, I hated it. I know there's some people that like I hated it. Uh, most of the Sonic Adventure games didn't like them, even though I know Adventure 2, you know, ended up being critically acclaimed. I wasn't a big fan of it. But then there's like games like Sonic Lost World. Loved Sonic Lost World. The only problem with Sonic Lost World was like two of the overall uh, levels were very poorly designed. Um, and those two levels are sometimes one of those things where it's so frustrating. And so it, it reminds you, like, you're like, okay, you're going along. This game's good. This feels like a, it, it was almost like Mario Galaxy version of Sonic. It was just amazing. And all of a yeah. sudden they throw this crap. And you're like, all right, this is still, this is still Sega. <laughs> Wasn't that one uh, partially Nintendo developed as well? No, no. Uh, mm-hmm. all oh, it was the, Nintendo all, exclusive. N- n- right. Yeah. Yeah. It was Nintendo exclusive and Nintendo um, allowed them to use, uh, I think it was a am- Amiibo to get uh, some Zelda stuff in it. That's right, yep. Um, a <laughs> Zelda level, I think it was, which was fine. Mm-hmm. I like that level. And forgetting the exclusivity, I didn't even care about the exclusivity. It was just, I really loved that game, outside of the fact that you had those two levels that just dragged the game to a halt. And you didn't really feel that way back with the old school Sonics. You would have tougher levels, you would have frustrating levels, but it still felt within the same flow of the game you've been playing the whole time, where these are like, just take you completely out of it. And I can understand why some people are like, yeah, it was great until. And I even put up a, a meme the other day on Nintendo Prime's Facebook page where uh, there's that, oh, I'm thinking about replaying this one game until you remember that moment that you have to do all over again. And that's what I'm like with that game. I love it. I want to replay it, but then you remember, oh, but I have to play that level again. And it makes me not want to do it. And that's kind of the way I'm with Sonic, where there's things I've liked about some of the games over the years, but not. there's always that one thing that it's almost like Sega, for like, oh, we have all these good ideas are going, and then all of a sudden someone on their team had a terrible idea, and the guy running the game's like, yeah, that sounds cool, let's do it. And it just ruins everything. Yeah. Um, and that's what's so crazy about Sonic Mania. I haven't played it. So I can't speak from personal experience. I've just watched a ton of videos. I've watched so many reviews from Easy Allies and kind of funny talking about it uh, to IGN. I know people don't like some of IGN, but I've watched a ton of YouTubers talk about Love it. IGN. I've watched a lot of live streams of it. So I feel like I've played it even though I haven't. And, man, it is what Sonic should have always been. And now I realize, you know, yeah. yeah, you can upgrade visuals over time. It doesn't need to be the sprites. I don't think the sprites are actually why the game is good. I think that's just why it's nostalgic, because it is new level design using old school elements. And you know, mm-hmm. obviously, it was made by made by fan studios. But that's what they did. That's why they got hired. It's great, but it's it's crazy to me that with how well this game is doing. I mean, if this isn't a wake up call to Sega, I don't know what is because. Fan-made studios who were fans of Sonic created a better Sonic game than you have created in essentially 20 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, like, before we keep going down that line, uh, let, let's see what the other folks have sure. to say. So it sounds like, Nate, you've got a lot of experience with Sonic. <laughs> oh, I, Eric, I, I, what about you? Yeah. Um, I've really only played one Sonic game. Which ever. one? I don't even know what it's called. Was it on the Genesis? Yeah, it was, no, it was on my uh, Game Gear. Game Gear. Game, game Gear. Gear. Oh, yep. yeah. That, yeah. Dude, that, I, I, don't remember, I don't remember what it was called, but that yeah, game was yeah. good. Yeah, it was really good. I, I There was like five of them on there. I don't remember which one it was, but... Um, was it the port of Sonic 2? I have no clue. Okay. Sonic 2 honest. actually on Game Gear was not a port. It was a completely original game. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't remember. This is, I mean, God, yeah. I'm 31. Yeah, I really yeah. don't remember yeah. back then. It's been so long. Great. Pretty cool, huh? But... Uh, yeah, no, uh, that's really the only Sonic experience that I've had. Um, okay. It, it's, I'm kind of indifferent with Sonic. I, I mean, if I play it, I play it. If I don't, it's not going to kill me. Yeah, I think it's one of those. <laughs> well, I think it's one of those, if I own Sonic Mania and got you to try it, you'd be like, okay. Yeah, probably. Okay. This is what yeah. I remember when I played on Game Gear. Like, this is... Mm. All right. That's 8 bit mm-hmm. Sonic, too. That's not even 16 bit mm-hmm. Sonic. So that's right, right. Yeah. <laughs> the worst it can look. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it depends on what your definition of worst, worst. is. Yeah, right? <laughs> to me, that's probably yeah, the best. Sonic 06 I mean, still still I mean, there, there are some 8 bit games that are fantastic even to this day. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, and those games did look pretty good for, for Game Gear. 
Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, keep you right. If, if only the batteries could last more than twenty minutes. Yeah. No. I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. That's why I plugged it in most of the time. But I had this giant battery pack that was yeah. like five pounds that you oh, screwed yeah. onto yep. the back. Yep. Well, I had that for Game Boy too, and Game Boy lasted longer, but still, it was like, oh, you get like four or five hours on yeah. Game Boy, and it's like, okay, so I got the big battery pack, I got the magnifying glass, I got the lights, I got the <laughs> extra yeah. speakers. Yeah. Right. That big, right. that yeah. big setup. You see, like I had that, yeah. or at least my dad yeah. did, and I kept yeah. just taking it from him because yeah. I'm like. Um, yeah, well, there's no back of the screen. Uh, it is really tiny. I can't always see what blocks I'm hitting with Mario. Right. No, <laughs> yeah. uh, but 90% of the time when I was playing my Game Gear, I was playing MLB 97, so. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, oh, yeah, what so. A game, what a game. Yeah, no, so most of the time, I, I really didn't even, I had Sonic, but I didn't really play it either, so. I think, so I, played more, too I, think I played Sonic on your Game Gear more than you did. Yeah, probably. Because <laughs> I love Sonic, so but it wasn't on Nintendo, so. Are you intrigued by Sonic Mania at all, Eric? Um, I haven't really seen much of it, so I can't really say. I, I have seen, uh, I think, one video of it, and it did look like old school, so I would yeah. definitely be willing to try it. Yeah, I think it's sure. something you, you you try, and then you'd see if, it, if yeah. it's like, okay. Yeah, but like I said, I'm kind of indifferent, where if I don't have it, it's not going to kill me. I, I It's not like, right. like Zelda was, where I had to go out and get yeah. it, because it looked like absolutely sure. amazing, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, so. and that's crazy for him because he's never really been a Zelda guy. Oh, great! That's, he hasn't yeah. been a Nintendo Perfect. guy since well, sixty four. Yeah. yeah, and even then, it was, well, we both had N sixty four. Yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah. You've been more Xbox. That's it, Xbox and that, that's it. Yeah. Well, you always had like a Nintendo handheld of some yeah. type. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you've. That's what was so crazy to me is like okay, you've never even when you're handhelds, you never were a Zelda guy. You know, the only time you played Zelda is when I needed help. Yeah. With Zelda Informer. So it's like, yeah. Okay. Or, so or you're, wait, wait, you're buying a system day one for Zelda. Wait, wait, uh, hold yeah. on. Yeah. Hold on. Not only that, you're buying the, like a collector's edition. Yeah. Wait, wait. Whoa. Ooh. Well, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I didn't even do that. You're not yeah. even like a, like this huge mega fan of Zelda. It's just like, this is my first real big Zelda experience. Yeah. You chose a good one. By the oh, way. yeah. Going all yeah. in. <laughs> but, but it's like, man. By the way, not all the games are like this. Oh, I, so just I, I realized that. I've, I've watched you play. <laughs> I've probably played parts of every single <laughs> yeah. Zelda game. Because, just from watching me. Just from you. <laughs> yeah. But oh, all those 18 years of my life. Right. Um, so this could change but, your mind. It changed your mind on Zelda. It could change your mind on Sonic. Maybe. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think it's one of those. I think what helped because he you were in a unique survey of Breath of the Wild where I think if you hadn't played it at E3, you might not have been sold on it. You might have said, Oh, that mm. looks cool, but it looks like every other open world game, maybe. Possibly. I mean think about how yeah. much fun you have with oh, that. Oh yeah, demo. no, no, definitely. Yeah. Like, I don't think oh, you were sure. sold on Switch or well we didn't even know what Switch was then. Or sold even on Breath of the Wild until you played it. Like, oh right. this is a cool booth, but yeah. Then you play the oh, game right, and you're right. just you're having fun at the top, just pot shotting guys with yeah. arrows. Oh and god, I was I was that was destroying. You're just having a blast just the back of it. Yeah. So I think while this game might not have the visual appeal, oh, that, that initially, initially, yeah. like, like right. it's not like blowing you like, oh my god, this is like a, a, a potentially right. a new generation of game. Aiming at the nostalgic I think audience it's one versus of those the modern that, audience. I, and I, I'm not saying this from experience, but I'm I think you could play it and be like, so. okay, I need this game. I, and I think that could be. Mm -hmm. That's only twenty bucks compared to a sixty dollars game. Right, that that, that does help. Um, or yes. or if you still want to try out the Russian eShop, ten dollars. Hey, why not? Might still be. Yeah. And I, I actually could possibly could read a couple of the words, words before we bring up the old high school oh, yeah. Russian. Yeah. I, see, nice. my yeah. the thing. The funny thing is, my fiance should be able to read all of them. She used to be native to Russia. Nine years, or first yeah. nine Ooh. years of her life, she spoke it. She wrote it. It's all she knew. She didn't even know English when she got adopted. And wow, very cool. now she can like say her name. Yeah. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> she knows no Russian anymore. Nine years Oops. of her life. Just like, that didn't even happen. Yeah. Uh, game over Jesse. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my experience with Sonic was obviously when the games first came out and they were fun. Uh, I always grew up as the Nintendo kid. Uh, mm -hmm. I always had the NES, Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64. I never really had a Sega. I remember my uncle having one of the early Sega consoles and like sneaking to play it yeah. because he didn't <laughs> want the little kids to yeah. touch it. Yeah. Um, I remember so that, that was... reputation back then. Super Nintendo's for the kids. Genesis for right. adults. Yep. Yeah. The old that's, console war days. Love it. That's basically how it was. But uh, So I grew up playing Nintendo, but I did play uh, Sonic, and it was fun for the most part. 
And then I didn't really fall in love with the franchise until Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, but the um, my experience with Sonic Adventure was I had a disc that was heavily scratched and I did not have a memory cart. So if I played it, I would have to play it all in one sitting, but then every time I would get close to the last level, it would freeze because of the scratch disc. Oh, come on. So I would play the game over and over and over to where I could just beat the game in just a few hours, but I would always get somewhere in the last level and it would freeze. Um, (laughs) Past that, Sonic... uh, did you have oh, a, uh, just a question? Did you have a blockbuster near you back then? I did not. Oh, I was gonna say they used uh, to fix scratch <laughs> games for like five bucks. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> some some of the recent Sonic games are okay. The Nintendo exclusive Sonic games, so like the Sonic Boom series, <sighs> was kind of odd because they were looked at as like a new evolution for Sonic. They gave him a new look. They gave mm-hmm. all the characters different looks. They had Maybe the former cartoon. Naughty Dog studio members. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had the, the cartoon. But I think yeah. what really messed with those games were at, whenever they started making the game, it was being developed with Crytex Engine, which at the time wasn't even capable of running on the Wii U. So they actually had oh. to uh, they got a bunch of people who developed the Cry Engine, whatever number it was, to work with them to get Sonic running on the game. And then the Sonic games were also multiplayer. So then the engine wasn't multiplayer capable. So they had to create this custom <sighs> version of the engine. That, yeah, because there's uh, no other engines uh, available in the world, you know. Yeah, Almost right, like they right. made the wrong choice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, they spent most of the time that they were trying to spend uh, to create actual fun in the game. Most of the work went to just getting the engine to run with multiplayer, which was bad enough, and then getting the engine to not just run with multiplayer, which it wasn't designed for, but to run on a console that it wasn't meant to run on. That what? I did not know that. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that's why the Wii U games uh, were so bad with it. And then there was the statement by the president or vice president, whoever it was, that was like, we know in the past the Sonic games weren't as great, but going forward, we hope to create oh, yeah. like put actual effort or whatever statement yeah. was into the we're game. recommitting ourselves to quality yeah and then like the funny part was this would be a good statement if sega got a new president in charge or someone new and they were like hey right. the leadership before we know they weren't doing sega and sonic justice but we have new management so we're going to move forward and try to make the best sonic game this is just the same person being like okay the last 10 years were crap. Sorry, we'll try to do better next time. <laughs> I didn't care, but maybe I do now. <laughs> yeah. It's a possibility. So, uh, like, there was that statement, and everybody was like, well, you know, of course they're going to say this because they want to put hype out for their next game. But it turns out they're doing all the right things. Uh, Sonic Mania, everyone's saying it's the best Sonic game, which yeah. is good because Sega, who has... <laughs> clearly not made the right decisions with the Sonic franchise isn't making it. It's the fans who grew up playing Sonic games. They know what's fun about Sonic. They know what fans are wanting for Sonic because they are the fans for Sonic. So they're making the games that they want to make, not necessarily the game they think will just make the most money. Sure. So I think that's why Sonic Mania has turned out so well. And then with Sonic Forces... We'll just have to wait and see. Um, because <laughs> yeah. if, if Sonic Mania was really good and it was actually made by the same team that's making Sonic Forces, then, yeah, I would have a lot of hope for Sonic Forces. It's still a 3D game and not a 2D game, but there's still hope that, hey, they actually understand fun game design. Yeah, what but makes Sonic fun? Yeah, but it's a completely different team, so it's like, well... Yep. That wasn't even the people that made this, so we're still kind of worried about the next game. But with the going back to the original question, Sonic Mania, like it seems perfect for the Switch. You could play it on the TV like you can with the PlayStation 4 other consoles. 
but to me it it seems like more of a handheld type game like it, it's not this big open adventure game it looks like it's made to be played like on the go like if you have game five minutes maybe. good beat this mm-hmm. level if you have 10 minutes try a couple of levels Sure, but I think that also is just how the original Sonic games were. Mm-hmm. But yeah. now with save points. Yeah, <laughs> instead right. of having to start over every time. Yeah. Or if you hit that halfway point where you had... Wait, no. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, but that's the wall. The, the system is still turned on, but you turn your right. Genesis yeah. off and Very you true. have to start over. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, it's, I'm, it, it's really interesting to me because we know there's other Sonic games in development right now. Mm-hmm. Um including, you know, what they call the next true mainline Sonic game. And it's like, but, I mean, do you see what just happened with Sonic Mania? The bar is now high as hell, and we know you can't reach that bar. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you... I'm not going to say it's impossible, because people always look at the Sonic games, and they're just like, man, Sega sucks. They they are not a good developer anymore. And it's like, that's because you just look at them in the microcosm of Sonic. They don't understand Sonic. They yeah, created yeah. this thing that they don't understand. <laughs> they lost control. It'd be of like, it. like I said, it'd just be like if they radically changed Mario, and we know Mario's going through radical changes, but like made it in a way where they forgot what the essence of Mario is, and just destroyed the franchise Mario over Paint. the years. Mario Paint, <laughs> Mario, the, the <laughs> Mario keyboard game, Hotel Mario. Oh, yeah. um, but as I said, you know, as I said, for every example of what might be a bad uh, Mario Mario's game, missing. there's <laughs> the mainline Mario games are not. Uh, yeah. So e- even the games, like even with the new Super Mario Bros. series, like yeah, I got redundant, but the games were never bad. Right. If you only played one of them, it wouldn't matter which one you played. You probably would have liked it. Yeah. Um. You know, it's just like Mega Man Nine. You're like, yeah, it's just like classic Mega Man. That's why it's good. Yeah. You know, and the, and the thing is, that's not the only time. And the crazy thing is, like Sonic was basically only considered good with the Adventure series. And with the classic games, right? That's yep. really the only times where it's been universally considered these games are really good. But yes, I know some people like me like like Colors Generations, like Lost World, but that was never universal advance. praise. Yeah, you know, it wasn't universal praise, and advance obviously. So you look at that, and then you look at what they're doing now. It's like okay, Sonic Mania is universally praised. They haven't been able to do that in a long time. And no. it was done without Sega doing I was anything. Say, they still have yet to do it. That's in a long what I'm saying. Time. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I trust Sega with certain things. Like, they own Creative Assembly. They make the Total War series fantastic. The partnership that they did with the Warhammer series fantastic. Total War Warhammer was great. Now they're having Warhammer Two come out because the first one was so great. That's fine. That's fantastic. Sega still has good IPs and good games that they make. Everyone acts like they're go. Uh, Nintendo's gonna be the next Sega and gonna go out of business. Sega never went out of business. They just do software only, and just because Sonic hasn't been good doesn't mean they haven't made other good games. Mm -hmm. But my worry is this has put Sonic almost back on the pedestal. It took it's like Sonic is this iconic character, but no one can seem to see why it's iconic because it's kind of like Kid Icarus back in the day. Yeah, they didn't keep making Kid Icarus games, but they kept making Sonic games and they sucked. So like it felt like. Oh, Sonic and Mario. Well, Mario is clearly better because he's been more relevant. But like Sonic, if this is like me, Sonic's been dead for fifteen years. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you could just erase <laughs> the last fifteen years and it went. And that's saying like I enjoyed some Sonic games the last fifteen years, but it was never as good as it used to be. It's a rarity. And now it's like they captured. I think everyone who loves Sonic, including even new fans who maybe didn't even have never played a Sonic game, maybe mm-hmm. they're even captured because a twenty dollar price tag. You you might recognize the name Sonic. Because it's been around for a while. Plus, you know, you Nintendo Nintendo did help revive Sonic a little bit with those Olympic game games, mm-hmm. uh, especially with the younger generation that could play those. That's great. Mm-hmm. So they revived interest in Sonic. Now we finally have a Sonic game that kind of lives up to the reputation. And now it's like, okay, but we know that there's like two other Sonic games in development. One that's for sure is mainline. And we it's made by Sega. So I'm, I'm, I'm so scared that <laughs> like two years from now, all this goodwill is going to be thrown in the fucking garbage because they're going to run <laughs> Sonic through the freaking gutter again. Uh, and the thing is, yeah, everything we've seen nuts. on the new Sonic game, none of it looks bad. It looks no. interesting, um, but <clears throat> none of it looks we, great. But like they've they've done this before. 
That's uh, the the Zelda cycle is like about people loving and hating the game, but no matter what, Zelda games have generally they're good games. No one really disagrees that they're good games. So mm -hmm. when you look at Sonic, it's like the Sonic cycle is they release teasers, everything looks good, people get hyped, the game release, it sucks, it tanks, everyone thinks Sonic <laughs> is done, and then they release teasers for the next Sonic game, looks good, looks hype, maybe, maybe, and, then, and that's maybe, the thing, like, no. the next Sonic game, it looks decent, I, I don't see anything I don't like so far, but yeah. the reputation tells me it's not going to be good. The, it, it might have a fantastic first level and then just <sighs> shit the bed, because that's what they do. Well, see, yeah. A lot of people, uh, well, the developer, or the developing key team for the main Sonic games is just called Sonic Team, I believe. It's okay. And they actually worked on other games outside of Sonic, even though they're called mm -hmm. the Sonic Team. That's why they should just and... be like Nintendo e EAD Group 1, Group 2. Group <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, as amazing as Sonic Mania is and the hype for... Uh, Sonic Forces, I think they need to put all of their effort into making a sequel to Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg. <laughs> there you go. There, there we, we go. go. <laughs> oh, man. I have not heard that in so long. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crud. That takes me back. That almost yeah, takes me back God. to the Earthworm Jim days, man. Oh, God. oh Earthworm Jim. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jim. Earthworm Jim. Oh, boy. Oh, and even back to the old, uh, uh, what was the name of that, that game where you played as the little plastic army men? Army men? Uh, army men. Yeah, army men. Army men. One, army yeah. men. Army men. God, that game. Man, yeah. It was so good. Those old yeah. games. Why don't games like this? Where's my Toy Story world? Oh, I guess it's coming in Kingdom Hearts 3, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyways. Well, I think that's going to do it for this week's podcast. Uh, oh, I had that fun uh, stinger topic. Maybe we want to try it real quick. Well, what's, well, oh, well nothing's real quick with us. But yeah, right. We'll give, right. Give, it okay. to, give it to well, me hard just, and fast. Just see if we can come up with one idea. <laughs> so we have this fan studio revived uh, the, a series that's been trying to be good and has sucked. What other <laughs> game series out there are trying to be good and they're just not getting there that we would like some fans to revive properly? What do you guys think? Right Is now, it? Sonic. Well, <laughs> 3D audience. Sonic, I'm, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, 3D Sonic. Man, Star that's, Fox. That's tough. Because Star like, Fox, yes. Sure. Yeah. I'd say that, but Star uh, Fox 2 is coming, and I bet you it's going to be awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that was a game that was in 1990, but, but whatever. But never released, it's an old so it's game. a new release. Yeah, but it was I don't care when the game was now. I don't care when the game was developed. It matters when did I Mega get to play Man. it. Is a really good franchise that, that the creator, uh, I believe he was the creator of the franchise, one of the creators, tried making his own spiritual successor. Yep, and my it number nine, and it turns out crap. he was not the talent. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I think uh, since Capcom for some reason doesn't want to put out a Mega Man game, they need to have some fans create oh, their own idea spiritual successor. I'm on board a thousand see, percent. This is hard. Really this is hard because mm -hmm. every time I think of like franchises that I I feel like I want a fan revival of it, uh, and obviously when you're talking about Nintendo games, yeah, but like officially games, back too, yeah, not like, just like, like those back, fan yeah. games. That but get but it's like every time I think like, oh, I want like I want a new F Zero, but then well, Neo Geo <laughs> exists or the not yeah. that they're like like the, the F Zero rate that oh my god, I can't even say it. Right, I, right, I have, fast racing, fast RMX. racing, yeah, fast yeah. racing RMX. Fast Racing Neo, I think, was what it was on Wii U. Yeah, the original. Yeah, uh, yeah. so it's like, the game kind of already exists, bad. it's just not called F-Zero. So it's like, yeah. okay, and then I'm like, oh, well, Metroid, oh, wait, they have Metroid 2 Remake, and they also have the uh, Metroid Prime 4 coming, so like, Nintendo's already doing that well. And besides, Metroid, I think it's had better treatment than I feel like the sales have dictated that it should get over the years. Mm -hmm. Because uh, yeah. there are a lot of series that Nintendo has completely canned that sold way better than Metroid. No idea why they did it. They just did it. Like, um, it, like a little dough fat, they own the rights to 1080 snowboarding. That game mm. sold phenomenally well, and they never made another one. Well, no, that's true. They did make a really shitty one on GameCube. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the problem. It was like outsourced to like some weird company. Was Tony just Hawk. Not good. Tony, Tony Hawk, tried, they tried coming back. But what I can care. think of, they tried bringing Guitar Hero back too, and that didn't go well. 
Um, God, I'm trying to think of just one franchise that I feel like fans could... Because, like, Sonic's this unique situation where I feel like fans could do it better than the original. Or as good as the original. They, they could do better than the teams could do today. And when I'm trying to find a game, it's like... like I could obviously think of a zillion franchises that haven't been around for a while I'd like to see fans make, but that that's not because I don't think the original studio could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I it's think just if, that they're not going I think if there was any franchise, um, I'm going to – I maybe it's a cop-out because no one's brought it up, but it, they're also really popular franchises that I'm not sure the original studio could do well anymore. We're talking Banjo, Kazooie, mm. oh, yeah. mm-hmm. and the Conkers franchise. I, It's not that I, – I don't know. I'm not going to say that – Rare doesn't have the talent because Sea of Thieves looks pretty good. They, they finally yeah, were does. able to create an original IP away from Connect. And the, the fun thing is, the funny thing <laughs> is, people laugh. It's like, this is why like, I don't know how much talent left because Rare made the best Connect games. Well, that was so the like, thing. When yeah. Microsoft's like, you need to make Connect games, like, okay, well, they actually make good Connect games, just no one cares about Connect. Exactly. So well, it's see, like, like, is the, the talent the, gone the or they, were they restricted, you know? Yeah, the whole situation with Rare not continuing those series on Xbox was that when Microsoft purchased them and then they were working on the Xbox 360 with the upcoming Mm Kinect, you would typically want to put whoever would be the most creative or the best studio you had working on new motion control games because if they're the most creative, then they might make... The best games sure. for the product, but um, they had they had games released on Xbox 360 that were not Connect games. Viva, yeah, the, Viva the Pinata Banjo. was fantastic. Like that was that's one of their first games they ever released that was great. But then you had that that uh, one Banjo Kazooie game that just nuts and bolts. Oh, that that mm, and, yeah. and that's when you were like, that's a good oh. example, yeah. And, and you're just like, okay, so that had still most of the original team, and. That was not good. It's like they no. forgot what yeah. made Banjo. Even Banjo and Tooie, well, not cool. as good as the original, was still okay. Yeah, it was. It was not okay. A terrible game. It, it was still like okay. You just need some fresher ideas. But this so is your idea I've got another ideas. idea for this then too. Uh, Castlevania fell out of graces when they tried to go with the Lords of Shadow business. Yeah, and I don't know if they ever intend on bringing it back. So let's get some fans involved. Make a new good Castlevania. <laughs> well, Castlevania's still around. There's not that style. Really. Yeah. Where? Yeah. When was the last uh, time they put out a Castlevania? I don't know well, which one of you. Look it up. The Netflix anime. Well, yeah, they have the Netflix right. anime, but anime last, came out. No game comes game. with it. Where's the sense? No, there there has been some some Castlevania games released in the last ten years that have done really well. Yeah, right, right. I don't remember. Ten years, but probably not for the last six years. You know well, what I'm, I mean? I'm, I'm Eric what, what's it Blood Knight or something like that, like the spiritual successor. The, the, yeah. The, oh, uh, Bloodstained. Yeah, Bloodstained. It looks that's the cool. original game. Where's the, the most recent release? Yeah, and then um, did you type in most it? recently released? I, but okay. you were talking Latest earlier about game. Metroid. Nate, and it reminded me of the recent fan remake uh, where the guy was hired on by the development team behind Ori mm-hmm. and the Blind Forest because he oh, was yeah. working on the fan remake to uh, the second Metroid game. Yes. Nintendo said, "Hey, you can't do that." And then another development team that makes Castle, or not Castlevania, Metroidvania-style games was like, hey, that's pretty good. That's basically the same type of game that we make. Why don't you come and work for us? Yeah. The so so last cool. games they made, uh, Castlevania, Lords of Shadow, Mirror of Fate. That was on 3DS. And Lords of Shadow 2. 360 and PlayStation 3, and then they had Shadow 2. Uh, did not come out of 3DS. That was just 360 PlayStation 3 PC. Yep. So there has not been one uh, this generation. Now, there is some games that are related, uh, but they're not the Castlevania brand. So yeah. this generation, there the hasn't TVs. been. But as recently and as last generation, they had good Castlevania games. Well, Lords of Shadow 1 was considered a good game. Lords of Shadow yeah. Mirror of Fate was not considered good, nor was Shadow 2. Well, sure. see, they the problem here... Brand and then it I, died see, I like the one on 3DS. I don't know why. It, it, it was mixed. It wasn't again. It wasn't universally loved. Castlevania had been sure. The sure, problem here, that. you guys, you're talking about Konami. Yes, <laughs> that's yes. right. That's why we need the fans. As, as, Jim Sterling, best, as Jim Sterling says, "Fuck Konami." Yeah, the, their two best lead developers was the Igarashi guy and Kojima. And yep. neither of them are working for Konami. Yeah, and that was basically uh, they make the best Igarashi. 
Yeah, Igarashi was like the guy behind They make behind some of the most entertaining thing, yeah. casino machines at the casino. Yeah, and then Kojima, who had worked on some of the Castlevania games as well. Like, both of them are the two people that you would yeah. be like, oh, that's Nintendo or Konami's version of sure. Alan Uma, Miyamoto. Yeah. And neither yeah. of the, it would be like if Nintendo just fired Miyamoto, Alan Uma, and then was like, okay, what do we do for Zelda? Oh, they'd be fine. <laughs> See, here's the thing, though. Mine. Nintendo's actually better set up than Konami is. Like, Konami, for starters, their priorities are where the money's at for them. The money for them is pachinko machines pachinko. And, and casino machines. Like, I don't know how, if you guys ever go to a casino, but if you do, you'll notice there's a heavy bevy of Konami branded casino slot machines because that's where they make their money. They don't really make mm-hmm. their monies in video games, traditional video game space anymore. And they even said that after Metal Gear Solid Five came out, they're yeah. like, we're kind of not going to really make games anymore. Now, yeah, obviously, yeah, they, they still have. They've been kicking on the retro kick. They're going to do what they think is proper. Only games, yeah. Uh, they're going to do what they think they can make money off of. But they've kind of transitioned almost out of the video game space in the traditional sense. So, so sad. It, it sucks. It does suck. It's like a part of the childhood just taken away. They were a juggernaut but, like, of the Nintendo, NES and SNES Nintendo era. Nintendo Shigeru Miyamoto. Nintendo, one, Nintendo's obviously way stronger than Konami has probably ever been. But if you ripped away Shigeru Miyamoto, he doesn't really head up games anymore. The last game he headed up was Star Fox Zero, which people didn't like. Uh, uh, or it was mixed. Let's say mixed. There are some people that... that like, it had the making. Fox, if they could just get rid of the died. motion controls, yeah. it would have been fine. Uh, I think Star Fox is another great example of being like, okay, we want to make this game that makes use of everything the Wii U has to offer. Who can we put in charge of that? Miyamoto. Obviously, Miyamoto was one of because the Because he made these demos people, so. that the only one that was good was a mini game. Um, but, like, <laughs> you could take away Miyamoto, and I'm not saying he doesn't have any positive impact on Nintendo, but I almost see him more as a figurehead, a PR guy, and, well, he's, and he's advice. He gives advice. A creative mm-hmm. fellow. He, he's an advisor, right? He doesn't yeah. actually come up with the ideas and really create the games anymore. E.G. Anoma is still heavily involved. Obviously, he is the producer of the whole Zelda series. But there are plenty of other names at Nintendo that actually made the games. All the directors, Fubayashi and stuff. Like if they, if oh, if say sadly, an you know Anoma dies, Zelda's gonna be fine. They already have directors and that have ten plus years experience making Zelda games. Uh, so, like, Nintendo's at the mm-hmm. position where they can lose their top guys in every franchise and be fine because they have so much experience. And they have – this is really a credit to them over the past two generations. As much as maybe you didn't like the Wii, maybe you didn't like the Wii U, internally they did a very good job handing over franchises to younger developers. Yeah, and I remember there getting was them a, involved. Yeah. Where it's no longer Miyamoto does everything. Iji Inomo does everything because that's what it was <laughs> for a little while. Like, it was – the game they wanted to make rather than the game their team wanted to make. Uh, and that's kind of like where Breath of the Wild became a game the team wanted to make. Where That's not saying that Eugene didn't obviously have a huge influence. Of course he did. I mean, he's also the reason Zelda got delayed because of his influence. So, <laughs> it, yeah. it's... I, uh, I remember around the time Skyward Sword released, Nintendo made this statement that they were grooming younger talent to take over control of uh, the upcoming properties and stuff and that i'm guessing that's also when they first began concept development for games like splatoon possibly well i I think that might have been around the time they made that that whole team of people that their goal was just to make new ideas yeah i also kind of wonder if maybe miyamoto uh and um who was it uh that had left recently um retired i wonder if they didn't say guys i've got 10 years you know what I mean? Like, I, I know you guys want me around, but I need to retire. So I'll give you a 10-year window. See, do what you got to do to prepare yeah, for my know. departure. Miyamoto See, seems like a guy that I don't think is ever going to technically retire. I think this creative fellow right. thing was literally a position created for him. Yes. Um, where he, he could just do it till he dies. Where leave. he's just involved as much yeah. as he wants to be. Um, and so, And I think sometimes... As we saw with like Star Fox Zero, sometimes like involved as much as you want to be. Sometimes Nintendo's going to be like, "But look, you don't understand the new generation of gamers." Um, yeah. So like when it comes to a game where put significant money in, maybe you should just be like an outside advisor rather than the guy leading. And that's how crazy. Japan he, business he works. They he, don't he like led, to lay off no, their no. older employees. They, are, they like they to are give them a stupidly. Well, not stupidly, because I feel like 
if you've worked for a company 30, 40 years and are a huge reason that company is what it is, I believe in loyalty. Mm -hmm. um, even if you've reached that age where you probably should retire, it's still one of those things where you need to be loyal. Yeah. Um, well, because see, is... without that person, those other people don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. Like, it, he didn't own Nintendo, but he is a huge reason why it's there. Yes. Uh, and it, it's like, it's almost like a legacy, you know? Just like there's owners of companies, you know, you can... You can even look at some of the the NFL owners out there. You know, they made their their billions doing other things, but in many ways they've stepped back off of doing those things, and other people run the companies, and they just sit there and collect the money, because they were successful in the past, but now they're at an age where they essentially retired by putting people smarter than them in control, uh, yeah. and that's kind of I think what Miyamoto has started to realize, and we realized that with Switch, where he was the first one to say, "Don't like give me any credit for Switch." This was not my idea. I had nothing to do with development of this system. I wanted to make it. Weak and he said, too. and he said, this is like this is the first time. <laughs> oh God! He said, this, this is the first time in his career that he was not involved in the decision making process on Switch. And th that's to me just showing there is a changing of the guard at Nintendo. They mm -hmm. recognize that Miyamoto is not going to be here forever. Eiji Inoue isn't going to be here forever. Uh, even Kimishima is not going to be here forever. Uh, obviously, right. the late Satoru Iwata was not here forever, and you thought he was going to be here for another thirty years because he was young. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you know, it's <laughs> Bill Trinan. He's not going to be here forever. I mean, he's probably still got another forty oh, years, but you don't Reggie. know. You know, it's one of those. These people aren't going to be there forever, and right. it's important for them to instill the culture. And I feel like what happened is because of how it works in Japan, where they are fiercely loyal to their staff that have been there the longest and have been the most successful in the past that Nintendo for a while was kind of coasting right back in the day in the 80s 90s Nintendo was extremely inventive and creative with their IPs new IPs coming all the time new ideas coming all the time continuations of all those ideas coming so like they didn't just dump Mario to the side or Zelda to the side or Metroid to the side or Kid Icarus to the side at the time. They kept these franchises going while coming up with new ideas. And then at some point, I feel like around the N64 era, they just kind of stopped. They rested on their laurels. Yes, they still had Pokemon come out. That was fantastic, but that wasn't in-house developed, right? They owned the rights to it, but it wasn't. they didn't make it. They didn't create it. They didn't come up with the idea. They were heavily involved, but again, Game Freak, Pokemon Company, etc. So Nintendo was... Almost like they said, okay, we have this thing, we have all these IPs, we're extremely successful, we're not gonna, it's really expensive, gaming's getting more expensive, we're in the 3D space now, uh, and we're not going to keep releasing new IPs. And I know that doesn't mean they didn't try, there might have been some new IPs I'm not thinking of, but it felt, it felt like there really wasn't anything fresh or innovative until Pikmin came along. Yeah. And Animal Crossing. I, yep. And it's like, okay, but that was one game when it used to be like seven 10, 15 new IPs per generation. Maybe they all didn't stick, but they were trying. Always trying to do that next thing. And now here, with the people who made Nintendo successful for so long, reaching an age where they probably should retire, or I'm not saying Agent, oh no, we should retire. He's, he's younger than Miyamoto. But I'm just saying they've reached an age where they shouldn't be relied upon for everything. It's mm -hmm. Nintendo starting to realize, look, we need to start valuing our younger developers, giving them more freedom. And now we've seen, just this last generation, you know, you saw, I would, I'd almost even argue the, the last Metroid game on 3DS was more of a new IP than a Metroid game. Uh, and the thing Pretty is, much. it was a good game. It just should not, if they would have just eliminated the Metroid thing and just let it be its own. That was an example of old Nintendo forcing this highly yeah. unique IP that, that sounds great into a franchise. This is what Splatoon could have ended up being if they did it, if they forced Mario into it like they were going to. Um, sure. But, you know, you look at There's it, they have this younger developer. You know, <laughs> last generation, you know, so if you consider that one was a remnant of old Nintendo, but then they had Splatoon, and we can't forget about it just because it flopped sales-wise, codenamed Steam. Oh, I love that game. I loved it so much. I that knew, was a good game. I knew there was, when I played it, I'm like, I could tell there's enough little minor annoyances um, that, and, and combined with the fact the art style is going to be a love or hate, yeah. that it was going to be one of those games that it just wasn't going to sell well. And the story was weird. You know, like a very niche kind of game. But Nintendo <laughs> used to make these kind of games all the time. Mm -hmm. These extremely yeah. niche games. Like, it was okay. 
It, it was the, the B tier. It, it, it was the B tier games. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. The B tier kind of vanished for a while. And now Nintendo's like, look, so now we got Splatoon 2. The, the first year of Switch, they have ARMS. Who knows what other new uh, crazy IPs are coming? Retro could have yeah. been working on a new IP for all this time, for all we know. And Nintendo could have five new IPs to announce over the next two years. You know, especially if they're all, all focused development on one platform, because they're going to have their Marios and their Zeldas and their Pokemon and their Metroids, but then they're also going to have whatever the next ARMS is, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the next Splatoon is, whatever the next crazy thing in a genre that they don't do a lot in is. And it's cool thinking that Nintendo's back to that because that's when Nintendo was at their best. They continued the IPs they had and continued to evolve those IPs. Like it looks like, you know, they're still finding new ways to make 3D Mario fresh. Uh, they definitely found a new way to reinvigorate Zelda. Uh, at the same time, it's not holding back ideas like Splatoon. It's not holding back ideas like Arms. It, it's not we're doing these instead of making new IPs. It's we're innovating these franchises while introducing new IPs, and mm-hmm. that. To me, that's the Nintendo I grew up on. That's why I'm so ex- If anything about Switch makes me more excited, it's not the convenience of the platform. You know, I got my Switch here. Great, it's portable home console, blah, 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 blah. Awesome. I love everything about it, hardware-wise. But what makes me excited is that this feels like the Nintendo from my childhood, where they're hitting their main franchises with new, fresh stuff while hitting all these new IP ideas. And... That is pump plus, you know, obviously the fact of finally getting a Pokemon in <laughs> HD on a whole console like I've always wanted. But yep. <laughs> it's still it's it's just one of those Nintendo this is what Nintendo's bread and butter was when they owned the industry. They I guess owned is relative. Sega Genesis was pretty popular. Mm-hmm. We're not we're not gonna discredit the Sega Genesis versus the SNES back in the day. Uh, I believe the SNES still had the edge in sales. And if you want to, really, if you really want to compare, you bring the Game Boy into the mix. Forget about it. Uh-huh. I mean, yeah. yeah, Game Gear was there, but you know, eleven point five million compared to eighty, it's just not even a conversation. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's. A, I mean, you want to talk about crushing? That is a bigger crushing than the PSP took to the DS relatively. You know, DS only sold yeah. twice as much. I think it sold eight hundred percent more than the Game Gear. Uh, but again, you know, it, it didn't. You didn't feel like you were an inferior experience when you were playing around in Genesis and compared to a SNES. So. You look at Nintendo now, and I'm like, man, this is Nintendo at their absolute best. And I think that's mostly why I want them on one platform, because I've never seen Nintendo at their absolute best with everything going to one platform. It makes me really wonder, with everything going to one platform, they're going to have such a high number of games coming out, they're going to feel more bold about trying new ideas. Getting another codename Steam-like game out there, or another Splatoon, or an ARMS, or whatever crazy idea they have, doing more crossover games just because why the hell not? We we don't need them to fill the slate. We have enough games, but why the hell not? Yeah. And, and Nintendo, I don't think, has felt that emboldened since the old days when games were a lot cheaper to make. The risk was small. Uh-huh. It was a team of four or five people, took a year, threw some pixels together, had an idea, and if it didn't work, oh well. You were out a mil, maybe two, or now you might be out $100 million if you invest in a new IP. I don't. I, to be fair, Nintendo's always been really good with the budget. So new IP budgets like Splatoon was probably under forty million for the total budget for the game. Uh, in fact, I believe a report came out at one time they spent more on marketing than it actually cost to make the game. Uh, oh, impressive. Which it, well, that that just spoke to it, they didn't spend a lot on it because right. I don't know what it is at Nintendo. They are crazy good at managing their budgets because um, people are not underpaid. They just don't balloon their team to seven thousand people. And they keep people. They don't just like a, a lot of the teams. Are like, oh, we got okay. We're six months from launch. We got to add you know two hundred developers to our team to make sure we hit that launch date. Where Nintendo's like, well, if we have to delay, we have to delay. <laughs> we're keeping our employees. That's the big thing. Like, like yeah. we don't we don't budget. Like they don't budget per game. They just say, hey, we're, you know, there are certain things you have to budget for. You know, music budget. Whether you're gonna do orchestrated music. So, like there are some things you have to budget for. But when it comes to the actual development of the game, it's like, no, we have our team. We have our. There are the people. Who are going to make the next Breath of the Wild kind of game, the next Zelda game, or the next Splatoon, the next Arm? They already work at Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Right. It's actually crazy when you think about how Japan does it. It's not just Nintendo; just Japan in general does it compared to like the U.S., where like we're all about we need to hire all these people on contract for six months and then let them all go and then maybe give them a job again a year from now when we need them back again. And Nintendo's like, if you just keep the employees, <laughs> right? You make the games faster, anyways, and. It's not you're no longer budgeting for the game. They're just part of your company. So you know this is how much it costs to pay all your employees every single year. So how many games can you get out of those employees in that year to make money? 
<laughs> to, right, it's, a, actually, it's, it's, yeah. like, it's like a very like it's a very stable concept. It's why Nintendo, for the 31 years they've been in the video game business, for 29 of them, they've been profitable. But that's yeah. why they're like, oh, Nintendo's going to go out of business. You know why they could have enough money to survive for 50 years? Why lose, They could lose $300 million net per year and still be around and not go bankrupt for 50 years because of the model they built. And the, because of the model they built, there's no way in hell they're going to be $300 million down every year. Um, I mean, they've been experimenting with scaling a little bit. Like, they've been sure. using they've Monolith been, and yeah. Bandai Namco but and that bringing, kind of stuff. Yeah, but they're bringing in teams, either third parties that, that are also as stable as they are, like Bandai Namco. Yeah. Or, like, Monolith, who Nintendo owns. Those are Nintendo yeah. employees. They're just shifting employees around to the games that need yep. it. That's not... They're not paying those employees more. They already are right. under salary. They're just saying, look, you're done with your game. Come help us with this game, and then we'll put you back on your game when we don't need you anymore. That's yep. that's what a company should do. Shift your assets around. Mm-hmm. Like, you need more developers to finish off Breath of the Wild. You don't hire more. Use internally. Be like, look, you're working on something. Can you pause for a couple months? Come help us out. Like and when we'll retro back in your project. And, and the Mario thing is, Kart yeah, like stages. when you're done with your project, we'll give extra people from our Zelda team to you that, that can help it, keep it on track. Like it's it's a really give and take type atmosphere. And some of this is because Nintendo obviously doesn't focus on we need to get a Mario game out every year. We need to get this out every year. I mean, there are Mario yeah. games that come out every year, but like a mainline Mario game, we don't have to have it yearly. So some of this is based on like Call of Duty and other games that come out every year where they have a rotating development team and a rotating cycle which is why some Call of Duty games are really, really good. Some Call of Duty games are not, because it depends on which studio has spent the last three years making it. Uh, whereas With Nintendo's like, we have like the same studio making all of our mainline games. Like the Zelda team that made Breath of the Wild, same Zelda team that's going to make the next one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah, the team that made Triforce Heroes wasn't the same, but it's also a very different game than a traditional it's been Zelda off. game. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, it's mainline, part of the timeline. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Really? Get, 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 yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. It's, it's officially a sequel to a Link Between Worlds. Yep. It's a sequel to a Link the, Between the Worlds. The main link yep. in the same game link. is the same link. Yeah. Wow. But only the one you play as. The other two are just are just dolls. Yeah. But like, yeah, I don't buy the timeline anyway. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought the timeline was bunk too, and then Nintendo decided to make it official by releasing Hyrule Story, and I'm like, okay. Yeah, they can say it's official, but it doesn't mean it makes any sense. Well, most timelines don't make sense. <laughs> yeah. Unless it's like quite literal Halo 1, Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 4. Exactly. <laughs> but then you got to start going to Halo Wars and all these other things in there. And it, it can get yeah. complicated with other franchises too. It's like, yeah. don't even try to put together a Mario timeline. So I've seen, <laughs> I've seen some attempts at it. It's not, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Yeah. Mushroom uh, Kingdom it, Castoria. You, it might as well just be the, yeah. the ones that try to make video games seem like they are all one cohesive like all of video game kingdom lives in one universe and why because oh in uh x game there was a grave that that said it's dangerous to go alone and it's like that's a reference to zelda so zelda is obviously connected to that game and this game's connected to that (laughs) game and in this game there was a a mario picture in the background even though the nintendo didn't even okay it they just slipped it in because one of the developers really likes mario so all the mario games are connected to resident evil or something crazy like (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's like that's how crazy it is some of the some when i see individual theories for how games go together it's like this is just as crazy as trying to connect every video game known to man because there's probably a way to do it oh, if you want to get crazy crazy. about it I, I think it's highly entertaining but it's I mean, everyone has to know that's not realistic right like developers don't think in their head man how can we connect skyrim to mario and zelda oh wait they did it yeah they did it they right. included the zelda costume so Officially, Skyrim is part of the Zelda world now. Whoa. And Zelda's part of Elder Scrolls. Whoa. <laughs> like, no, they're not thinking about that. But fans do. We make a lot of fun. I wish they would have just left it to the fans. Yeah. Um, because they kept saying it exists. That was enough. Yeah. It exists. We know where some of them go. Cool. Let it go. But yeah, I remember thanks, uh, story. there were quotes from Miyamoto where he was like, we have an official document in our desk. <laughs> I was like, no, you no, no. I, I think I always thought they, they have a, they have a document, right? But I, I always felt the document was just one of those loose things they have in a computer that kind of just explains the gist of what makes a Zelda game, um, what the, what some of the key elements are, and loosely how every game is is related in some fashion, but not necessarily in a timeline sense, right? Like in a gameplay mechanic, mm-hmm. in a world building yeah. sense, like it kind of like a formula, right? To to how because even Triforce Heroes, even as a side dish, there's a lot of things in that were very Zelda like. 
Um, and that comes from an understanding of what makes a Zelda game. Granted, people would argue multiplayer doesn't do that, but yeah, I don't know. I like Four Swords Adventures. I like Triforce Heroes. Mm-hmm. Like I like Four Swords, the the little side dish to uh, uh, Only to the Past re-release. Like it was great. I like those games. They're, they are as much a Zelda game to me as any other. They're just different. Mm-hmm. They're a different approach. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not they ever try attempt a three D multiplayer Zelda game, I don't know. I don't know how well it would be received. But, I mean, if they can have an indie Smash clone out there that looks really, really damn good, um, why not a yeah. Zelda Smash clone that's just Zelda characters? Mm-hmm. Like, who would not want to see a showdown between Tingle and Zant? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Has to happen. Has to. Oh, man. Even Crazy Zant. Take oh, off the helmet. Lord. Let him spin around and go nuts. Oh, <laughs> let, let Tingle Kula Limpa him and steal all his money. Come on. One day, force gems. Sorry, still those force gems. If if they could make like two or three standalone tingle games, <laughs> <laughs> I think this is possible. Oh my gosh! Yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna wrap up the podcast right there. As always, that's why, that's why we stuck with three. Oh wait, Eric's gonna try to say something. One like, thing. Oh, oh, this is what happens yeah. every time I try to wrap up. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. I. I you want to go to the casino tomorrow? Why? So you can see the Konami games? No. I'm gonna bring a. I'm gonna bring in a NES controller. I'm going to try to find a place to plug that damn thing no. in and type in the Konami code and see if I win the jackpot no. automatically. <laughs> Doesn't work. Doesn't work. I've damn tried. It. Damn it. I didn't try with an S controller, but like I tried to like figure out a button combination yeah, yeah. to do it. Yeah. But no, it doesn't. No. no come on. There's no secret Come trick. on, Konami. Konami wants money. They don't want people to win. Ah, come on, Konami. <laughs> um. Anyways, the funny thing is, one time I walked through the casino up 300, it was off of a Konami machine, but I probably lost over 300 to a Konami machine too, so <laughs> net negative loss, I'm sure. Anyways, uh, that's going to do it. Uh, for this week's podcast. Uh, as always, if you would like this podcast to become a weekly thing, you should head over to patreon.com slash Nintendo Prime. For just $1 a month, you get access to almost every single update on Patreon. Uh, the only ones you don't get access to are things that are exclusive to the $5 and up tiers, which include early access to the podcast. Every single time we post a podcast a day early, we have the full audio available for anyone who's a $5 backer or above. Uh, if you want to get crazy and back us for $20, you actually will be invited to be on a future podcast episode. Personally, by myself, I will contact you through email and we'll work out a way to get you on. Obviously, if you're going to support that tier, I just request you have a somewhat decent microphone setup and some sort of camera. Uh, if you're not comfortable being on camera, that is okay. We can just do just audio for you. Uh, it is perfectly fine. We prefer camera, but again, you're the, it's your money. So if you just want audio, that is totally fine. You'll be represented by a sure, Waluigi avatar. Make sure this, yes. is, just a, this is just a tip because <laughs> I've done podcasts with some fans before, so I'm just gonna throw this out there. Please wear headphones. <laughs> Please, mm. I'll I'll go over all the things you need to do anyways. But like sometimes I forget to mention wear headphones because I think it's obvious, but. If you've never done a podcast before, you don't know how big of that of that reverb difference makes when you're editing. Anyways, uh, so you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Nintendo Prime. Uh, the reason that this podcast is not weekly yet is because we have not hit our $100 goal yet. I believe we're at $31 right now. Uh, so if we get $70 or $69 more, uh, we will have a weekly podcast. This will be every single week. Uh, the reason it's not weekly is it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. Uh, and as a struggling YouTuber myself, uh, I have to put my effort into the things that are going to lead to, I guess, I don't want to say I make things for money because I make things I'm passionate about, but at the same time, while I'm passionate about this podcast, it eats up a lot of time Mm -hmm. and it's really hard for me to justify it when I'm trying to survive. I have kids to take care of. I have a family. Uh, and if I hit that hundred dollar mark to me, it just tells me that, we have people who passionately care about the podcast. And that's what I want to see is you guys passionately caring about this. And if you do not have the monetary support, that's okay. Just hit, give us a like, hit subscribe, go to 5J. Was it 5J Gaming on YouTube or is it just 5J? Yep, youtube.com slash 5J Gaming. Yep, and you can check him out. I know we have some people that always randomly comment on some of our videos. Hey, we want more 5J. I was just st- streaming Zelda, my Breath of the Wild uh, Master Mode run the other day, part seven, and they're like, hey, where's 5J? Or I got called 5J, and then I'm like, I'm not 5J. I'm like, oh, wait, where is 5J? I'm like, he's only yes. here on weekends, but if you want to see more streams of him, this is why he streams. Like, one, it helps us out. Two, it gives him some exposure. 
Apparently yeah. not good enough because you don't know. He has his own YouTube channel. Go to his YouTube channel. <laughs> go to his Twitch. Subscribe. He live streams like more on his own, on his own stuff than he does at Nintendo Prime. Although I think two, more. two of your last live streams that I think were are not, that wasn't your last, your most recent, but like a week ago, you live streaming this food thing. It was really interesting watching. Um, I've never watched Mola's a live stream. I know, I know. And I've never watched a live stream like that in my life. Just like talking and eating food. Um, yeah. Social eating. There's a whole category on Twitch. There, there is. I've never heard of it in my life. Why am I not a part of this? <laughs> right. Why are we not social eaters? Yeah, wait. Okay. New yeah. new channel. Prime eating. <laughs> <laughs> Prime eats. Prime eats. That's Ooh, right. That's Nintendo right. Prime steak. Ooh. <laughs> Just various types of yes. steaks all the time. <laughs> so I hate mushrooms, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that vomit. That was for you. Um, no, so, yeah, check us out on Patreon. Check out 5J. Uh, and Game Over Jesse, he's actually a bigger channel than us, so maybe you've heard of him before. But he is at YouTube at YouTube.com slash Game Over Jesse. Great guy. Love having him Thank on you. all the time. I, you know what made me mad is that last that last uh, conversation series you did, I wanted to be on it, but I was like, <laughs> you asked me, and I was like, yes, I want to do it. And then I just never contacted you to do it, even though I was <laughs> totally available and totally there all night. I'm like, oh, God. I just got distracted. That's a, that's a YouTuber life, man. We're, we're busy. Yeah. Busy, busy, busy. So it's really hard uh, keeping up. Plus, uh, you, like, making YouTube videos, you're editing so much that any time uh, that you do get for time, you're just like, I, I just want to relax mm-hmm. and it's, without it's, it's having hard. to be in front of a microphone. I mean, when you're and when you're small time YouTubers like this, it's usually you know we're we're all small time and streamers like, it's a, they're side dishes. They're not always the main way we make money, but we make some or we don't make any, and it's always a struggle because we're passionate about it and we want to do this uh, as much as we possibly can. But the realities of the world is, without money, we die. I mean, well, we don't necessarily die. We could go eat garbage or something, and be homeless. There's plenty of homeless people that live for a long time. Uh, but you know, that's not a lifestyle I want for me and obviously not for my kids or my fiance. I want a better life. So, you know, like I've done the college thing a few times. I'm technically still in college. Uh, don't know if that's really what I want to do. Cause this is what I'm passionate about. I like making videos on YouTube, despite the fact that you always have some haters that say, why are you still making videos on YouTube? You suck. You're fat. I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. Tell me something they don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> That's cool. Don't watch me. Right? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, it's okay. Like, that's a crazy thing about YouTube. Whenever I see people complain about a channel, it's like, but there's so many channels. Yeah. You could just not like. I understand if you checked out one video and you didn't like it, but it's like, for you to continue to keep coming back to bash, it's like, why? Yeah, I guess don't complain because you're being entertained by me in a different way. Yeah, entertained by my stupidity. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, like on, on my seconds. recent um, coverage of Bendgate happening again, uh, there was this guy named Joshua that was just like, "It's a lie. Switches are not bending. People are just abusing their switches. Yeah, because people are just <laughs> when they open the box and the switches bent, that <laughs> they, they, they physically did that themselves. Yep. It's like, oh my god. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure people are just lying and just taking really shit care of their switches that have no marks and no scratches on them, but they're bent. Yep. It's all photoshopped. It's all, well, it's all photoshopped. <laughs> yep. No one's actually sent their Switch in and got it repaired by Nintendo or anything. It's all fake. Uh, and that's the thing. It, it's weird to hear him say it because a lot of times he tries to have some semi-logical disagreement with me saying, you're factually wrong with this, you're factually wrong with that, but like, I'm not factually wrong. Like This happens. I've seen someone who had a bent Switch that had it out of the box. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know how much more evidence I need than that. I've seen it. It's not just Twitter post. I've seen it. So it's like, uh, come on, man. Come on. But that's the thing. He obviously is entertained by the channel because he keeps coming back. <laughs> there you go. He's like, oh, but I have Adblock on. That's fine. You add to my viewers, which creates more viewers, which gives me more money. Right. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, haters. <laughs> haters going to hate. Haters going to hate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing's worse than in the live streams, though. It does get annoying when someone pops on and starts saying, oh, dude, you're such a fat ass. And I'm going like, that's, that's cool. You're, you're gone. Yeah. And so, like, not because it bothers me, but because it's bothering other people. Yeah. That's right. what I always hate about those comments. Really. I, I am not offended when people call me fat or make fun of me for my, my face or my voice or my like whatever. I am who I am. It doesn't I called it. myself fat in my newest video. <laughs> get, get out of here. <laughs> fat. Get out of here. Uh, but it's like, okay, I get it, but 
it doesn't bother me, but it does bother other people sometimes, you know, and I know maybe people shouldn't be as sensitive, but it, it's still like it bothers them because people make that this focus point of the conversation during a live stream. It's like you're fat, you're ugly, you're this, that, but it's like that's not the point of the live stream. I'm not here to be a big, beautiful, buff guy. I'm not trying to get I'm not trying to get subscribers like Jake Paul and Logan Paul taking my shirt off six packs running around screaming doing crazy shit jumping off cars and lighting shit on fire like I'm not that's not who I am so like don't that's okay there's channels like there's channels out there if you want that we're all being friendly we're having one conversation and one guy just jumps into the voice channels like you're all stupid you're dumb you don't know what you're talking about you're like why are you go away (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> You're it's destroying like, everything. Get it's out of it's here. like if you want, if you like beautiful people doing things stupid or or otherwise or intelligent, there's YouTubers out there for you. It's like he jumps <laughs> in and, and you're an ass. So what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. Like even um, like like even what Jesse knows, like Holly Wolf, man, uh, jumping on her stream sometimes, and you'll always because of what she used to do, see people pop in and say inappropriate things about her. And she just kind of shrugs it off. She's seen it a zillion times at this point in her life. Uh, dude, I watched the map head video on the on the on game theory about the theory about why Jake Paul and uh, and Logan Paul blew up on YouTube. And part of it's because they were already really popular on Vine, so they brought over a bunch of people. Or a lot of it's because the controversy they creates between each other, and it creates this big. Everyone wants to see who's going to diss who and who's going to get mad at who. And really, they're probably behind the scenes not mad at each other at all. They know yeah, exactly what they're doing. It's totally, oh, yeah, yeah. it's completely calculated, and the drama it doesn't doesn't exist. But it drives viewership, and it drives it drives seventy thousand new people to like their channel a day. How many times a day do we call each other names and, and stupid crap? Yeah, but not for attention. Oh. Yeah, I know. But we, like, we could do it. Though, the, the, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, future podcast episode. Yeah. Fights breaking out. Yep. Tune in. Podcast episode 32. <laughs> Anyways, folks, I'm Nintendo <laughs> Robo Jets from Nintendo Prime. Uh, that's Game Over Jesse over there from Game Over Jesse. Obviously, got 5J over there from 5J Gaming. Eric Moore from Nintendo Prime as well. Uh, it's been fun, folks. We'll have our Twitter handles and appropriate links for any any of the stuff we talked about. You know, like you want to get Sonic Media, have a link for you to buy that down in the description. Uh, and obviously, full disclosure, any links I usually put the buy products in the description are affiliate links. It's another way to help support the channel. You do not need to use the affiliate links to buy the games. You can go to your favorite retailer, look it up, and buy whatever you want. Okay? Just a full disclosure. I like being honest about it. I know there's some channels that just throw the affiliate links up and don't say anything. It's technically illegal, but... They get away with it because it's the internet. I mean, come on. How many of you guys right now are emulating games? Let's be honest. Let's be honest out there. I'm sure you didn't attain all those games legally. Yeah. Anyways, folks. No emulators for me. No emulators. Maybe that's a future topic. We'll talk about emulators. (laughs) Oh, boy. I'm going to find some people that actually emulate. Well, the thing is, do they want to profess to it and and risk the public (laughs) attention? Yeah. Record. Well, I'll talk about it. I used to do it. So I guess I could talk about it in the past tense because I don't get in trouble for what I did before. So. Anyways, folks, we'll catch you in the next one. You guys can say bye, too, by the way. All right. Bye, everybody. (laughs) I love you guys.